Good evening, everyone. It's a great pleasure to welcome you all for today's program, Early Breast Cancer Perceptorship Program. So I would like to invite Dr. Sandeep Kukar, sir. Sir is the HOD, Department of Medical Oncology, Sohana Cancer Research Institute, Chandigarh. Sir, please start. Good evening, everyone. Am I audible? Yes, yes. Good evening, everyone. So, as you all know that breast cancer is one of the commonest malignancy in India and across the globe. And we all know that there are increasing number of breast cancer cases, particularly in the early stages, as we have accepted a bit of a screening program in metro cities and tier two cities. So we all are aware about the guidelines that have been laid for the management of early breast cancer, but still we all feel that there has been, uh, it, it all requires a deeper understanding of the disease, particularly in the early uh, stages. So we all have gathered here to discuss about the nuances of early breast cancer and uh, which is maybe you can say the pathological part is the most underlooked part. So starting from pathology to surgical part and the uh, advances in the medical oncology. So I welcome you all uh, for this academic knowledge sharing platform, where in this series, first of all, I would request Dr. Rajeshwar, sir, who doesn't need an introduction. He is a well-known name in the Tri-City and across India. So I request, sir, to please take on the proceedings forward and invite our first speaker. Good evening, Thank sir. You. Good evening. Thank you, Dr. Sandeep. Thanks for your kind words. So we have this important uh, today discussion on, like he said, that uh, a disease which is very, very common. In fact, it is commonest in our country. And as we are increasing in our uh, you know, socioeconomic status, the disease is also increasing. So uh, not wasting your time. And uh, uh, first session is on the role of pathological CR in HER2 positive early breast cancer, a pathological perspective. And the speaker is uh, Dr. Anila Sh Sharma from uh, RGCI Daily. She's an oncopathologist. And I welcome uh, Dr. Anila to please start her uh, talk. Dr. Anila, you are there? Uh, Ma'am, your voice is not uh, audible. Uh, yeah, now uh, I was not unmuted. Though I speak loudly, but I can't be heard to Chandigarh from Delhi. So good evening all. So you're, you're loud yeah, and clear. Yeah, thank you, always. <laughs> so this is my, I hope I uh, am able to share my screen. Are you able to see my screen? No, no, no. I no, ma'am, please okay. start sharing. Yeah, just a sec. So good evening all and thank you, uh, Dr. Sandeep and Dr. Rajeshwar for this uh, kind introduction and uh, thank you for having me over on such a great pa platform on uh, early breast cancer. And this is one of the topics which is close to our heart because uh, we deal with it day to day. So without any further delay, and just start. I try to make it, uh, you know, more clinical. Is my screen now, uh, are you seeing my screen? Yes. Kindly make it in PowerPoint. Uh, sir, I've done that. I'll just to see. Yeah, it's moving also. It's moving for you people? No, no ma'am. Uh, now? Ma'am, can you please make it full screen? I have already made it full screen. Just one do the organizer have the slides? Yeah, they also have the slides. But they yeah, have the yes, ma'am. Just one second. Is it full screen now? No, ma'am. Ma'am, I will share your screen, ma'am. Okay. Kindly I'll unshare. I'll keep on saying next. Kindly unshare. Okay, sir. Ma'am, please start. Okay. You'll have to move. 
Okay, I can move it. Yeah, I'm able to do it. Okay, so uh, prognosis of early uh, HER2 positive breast cancer after com uh, complete response is always good. But some of the patients, they succumb to their disease. So one needs to find and know the novel predictive factors to identify these patients at risk. A pathological complete response is also a surrogate biomarker for survival of the patient and it can be clinically useful in selecting patients for a shorter duration of adjuvant anti her therapy. So a uh, new adjuvant therapy, it provides, not only does it cure the patient, treat the patient, but it provides access to an important prognostic factor, which is the pathological complete response. Adding anti-HER2 antibody therapies to uh, adjuvant uh, chemotherapy doubles the PCR. And the patients who achieve PCR, they usually outperform others who are left with the residual cancers. But these pat the patients who have residual cancer, they may benefit from the escalation of an adjuvant treatment. So patients, uh, in a study by Elinora et al., patients with only moderate IHC HER2 expression meaning HER2 1 plus or 2 plus uh, or 2 plus with fish uh, positivity had a lower chance of these reaching uh, uh, the pathological CR and also experienced worse survival rates. In comparison, the uh, excellent long-term outcome of patients was seen in HER2 positive breast cancers, even if they had large primary tumors and lymph nodal diseases. So is there a difference between HER2 2 plus and 3 plus? So this is just to reiterate my further state, the previous statement. The patient had uh, who had HER2 uh, IHC score 3 plus, so their breast cancer specific survival probability was excellent and with a positive p-value. Now, uh, the uh, breast PCR rates they can vary according to the HER2 expression as can be seen in this animation where uh, HER2 uh, positive cases around 38% they showed a pathological complete response across all either ER positive or negative whereas the HER2 zero and HER2 low they had a lesser response rate. So, uh, does chemotherapy plus HER2 targeted therapy uh, have any role? The power of the new adjuvant approach in estimating the benefit of new therapy has been uh, beautifully summarized in this paper by Gianni et al., where uh, in this the various studies have been included and the circles, these small dots are the various studies and these circles are the number of patients which were included in the study. And they found that the odds of uh, having a pathological complete response was more when the patient had her to, in addition, had her, uh, was given her to directed therapies. So this is the definition of pathological complete response. It means absence of invasive cancer in the breast and all the sample lymph nodes. The presence of any residual IDC, it does not take away the definition of PCR. So that means if you have DCI, it does still it remains a uh, pathological complete response. And uh, uh, evaluation of the post uh, chemotherapy specimen and changes are challenging and complex for any pathologist. So one needs to have a standard approach to post uh, uh, any deep uh, assessment, pathological assessment. So these were the initial papers where they uh, recommended the various uh, protocols for reporting a pathological uh, evaluation after therapy and uh, the talk will, uh, will henceforth will broadly be covering the specimen handling, the size of the tumor, the number of lesions, the evaluation of axilla and uh, uh, how to uh, finally give pathological complete response and retesting of uh, biomarkers is, if necessary. Now, uh, for any pathologist to start the evaluation of a specimen, he, this information is essential, should be provided by the treating clinician and the operating surgeon. The form should tell the pathologist uh, whether it is post NECT, whether it is a part of any clinical trial, the results of pre-chemo hormone as well as HER2 status, uh, 
if we have the details of the lymph node status pre or uh, pre treatment uh, clinical tumor size before and after chemotherapy and information on margins should be given by the operating surgeons if they can make out at the time of surgery and clinical and radiological response to treatment in axilla should be documented so when we receive a specimen in the lab it is best to examine a fresh sample when we are um, evaluating for post chemotherapy uh, and the ischemia time should be noted and kept within 30 minutes and one needs to recognize especially when the juniors are crossing that it's a post chemotherapy specimen one needs to take in consideration the tumor size bed and uh, and whether there is a tumor bed or whether there is a tumor proper and cellularity, which is mostly seen on the microscopic examination, one needs to examine for the lymph nodes. And we uh, one needs to report as per the local family. We follow the CAP protocol here. So, uh, Garma, we are going a little fast. I didn't move. So, this is how uh, we uh, cut the section at, uh, say, 3 millimeter uh, distance. The entire tumor is cut and then it is inked and uh, this is just to show that how we map the sample. So uh, uh, the definition for specimen sampling as per CAP, special attention is required to find and evaluate the tumor bed. In the article by Provenzano et al, uh, they recommended that an image of the site, site specimen be recorded and then mapped. And in article by Bassett at all, uh, overly exhaustive sampling was not required as long as one was mapping the specimen. So uh, one uh, section per uh, one centimeter of the tumor is taken and the extent of sampling is determined by the pre-treatment size in addition to the macroscopic pathological evaluation. And uh, this is how usually a tumor bed will look like. It is a, a fibrous, rubbery area, and there are some yellow streaks, which uh, are, which are uh, because of the fat necrosis which happens in the tumor in response to any kind of therapy. And after the uh, photograph has been taken, we map the sample. And uh, this is after taking the picture at the time uh, the residents who's crossing. They'll put the labels like one, two, three, four, and where the sections are being taken from. So this is mapping. Now, when now coming to the microscopy, usually a pathologist will see fibrosis or elastosis, and uh, we'll see inflammation in the form of histocytes, lymphocytes, hemosiderin, and calcification. The tumor. Uh, uh, it changes its morphology and it can appear histocytoid. It can show cytoplasmic vaculation, histophilia. We see a uh, nuclear hyperchromasia and large, larger size of nuclei. The mitosis is, of course, less. So sometimes the tumor grade it becomes less because there is no mitosis post therapy. And it can be, the tumor morphology can be heterogeneous. And grading is always done post therapy also. And uh, the same, uh, we use the modified uh, bloom Richard uh, scoring grading for the uh, post chemotherapy tumors. Now, this is just to show, show how after on gross the tumor can look. Like the tumor size is unchanged here, but the tumor foci are scattered. And there can be a, a instance where the tumor size has decreased, but the cellularity of the tumor roughly is similar, and this is called concentric uh, shrinking. So, uh, tumor, uh, according to their hormonal status or HER2 positivity, can show uh, morphological variety. As for example, TNBC usually will show marked nuclear anaplasia and uh, cells which look like histiocytes. And the number of stromal fills will be more with tumors in TNBC. So, uh, coming to the grading of the pathological response, there are multiple uh, uh, classifications for grading, the pathological response once uh, the pathologist sees. Uh, the two commonly used are the AJCC and the 
residual cancer burden that is the RCB score and index. So the AJCC, it just takes into consideration the size of the invasive component, just one biggest size, and doesn't take the span uh, if there are two or more foci. And the categories in AGCC are usually four. Coming to the RCB, so in residual cancer burden, one needs to consider the tumor size in two dimensions. The percentage of residual invasive cellularity, the number of residual involved lymph nodes, and the size of the largest metastasis. So there is an RCB calculator and uh, where this uh, formula is used and it gives a, a score to it. So uh, uh, the RCB index is determined from the um, bi-dimensional microscopic diameter, the cellularity, portion of carcinoma in C2, number of metastatic nodes, and dimension of the largest metastatic tumor deposits. So uh, for example, in this case, a tumor uh, was uh, divided into five, and there were five different sections. So we calculate the percentage of uh, the cellularity of the tumor on each particular slide. And then we average it out. And then percentage of DCIS, so in this case, say, was only 1%. And the size of the tumor was 8 millimeters in one dimension, 6 in the other. And cellularity as calculated uh, as average is 20%. And in C2, we noted was 1%. There were no positive nodes. So one needs to calculate. And the residual cancer burden came to 1.477. And it uh, was categorized into the class of RCB. So there are four scores for RCB. Uh, the score zero is pathologically complete response. And uh, uh, RCB three is scored more than 3.28, where the tumor is said to be chemo resistant. So RCB index and classes prognosticate in all treatment cohorts and phenotypic subsets. Now AJCC. It, is, uh, it takes into account the largest single contiguous focus of invasive carcinoma and excludes area which are uh, intervening fibrosis or sclerosis. And if we have multiple foci, we put a uh, small m in front of the YPT, indicating the multiple foci of the residual tumor. Additional information is always given like how many tumor foci one is seeing and over what span the tumor foci extend. And number of the sections which, in which the tumor foci was seen. So uh, just to compare the RCB and AJCC, now RCB is this purple arrow. So we are, one can see that one focus is here, one is here, bigger focus is here. So you include it like this, like a cross. But in uh, AJCC, you just take the, into account the largest tumor focus. And that staging is according to that. We can skip this and just go to the next slide. So coming to LVI, uh, uh, some uh, there are uh, there is a debate uh, whether a residual LVI should be taken as PCR or should not be taken as PCR. But uh, whenever we see lymphovascular emboli, we uh, put it in our uh, report and we confirm it. Uh, sometimes if we are not sure whether it is retraction artifact. Or if it's a lymphovascular emboli, we put a D240. So that helps us to distinguish. And accordingly, we report. Because if it is a retraction artifact, that means it's pure, it's uh, tumor and it is residual. So uh, if there is lymphovascular emboli at the margin, it is separately mentioned in the reports. So then again, we tell the number of the lymph nodes, the size of metastasis, etc. Now, lymphovascular emboli is associated with poorer uh, progression-free survival and overall survival. And intralymphatic tumor, it carries adverse prognostic significance even in absence of any residual tumor in the uh, tumor bed. We can go to the next thing. Yeah. So this is uh, axillary lymph nodes. Uh, they are bisected either along their long axis, submitted as a whole, 
or better to perpend uh, along the long axis if you just perpendicularly put uh, slice and then put it for uh, processing. Now coming to the important topic of retesting for biomarkers. Biomarker conversion after NAD in patients without pathological complete response has a prognostic significance. And if the patient converts to triple negative status, then the overall survival is worse. And whether uh, to, to uh, test or uh, not, it should be based on a multidisciplinary discussion. And a positive result, uh, it can make the patient eligible for targeted therapy. Now, this is one good paper by Zhu et al. It's, I think, 2023. Uh, where they have done a study on uh, 2,489 cases. And they studied the uh, two category change between primary and residual disease. So uh, one can see that uh, the HER2 zero, some um, HER2 zero, some 40% cases became HER2 low, that is one plus. Whereas uh, HER2 low cases post therapy uh, only 15% became HER2 zero. But HER2 three plus, they remain true to their type and only 2% converted to HER2 low from HER2 three plus. So this is one case to exemplify whatever I've been talking. So this is a 47-year-old female with a breast lump and a, a grade three tumor, HER2 positive. And I'm gladly uh, continuing your talk in two minutes, please. Yeah, I think I'm about to finish. This is the whole body therapy and which is showing response. We can go to the next slide. So, next, please. And this is just that same fibrous area which I've told you uh, that this is how the tumor bed looks like to the pathologist. Next. Next. So mapping uh, of the tumor uh, bed in entirety. Next. So this is just to show how the histocytes look to us. And these are the lymphocytes. So there is no tumor here. This is the tumor bed. Next. And these are few atypical cells. And which on CK uh, were positive for CK. And hence they were residual tumor. Next. Yeah, this is CK. Uh, next, we can go to the next slide. So this is the tumor in two dimensions, eight millimeter into two millimeter. Next slide, please. And we put it in the RCB calculator. So it is uh, the tumor size is eight into two millimeter. Cellularity was twenty percent. There was no DCIS, no positive nodes. So the RCB burden was one point three four eight, and the residual cancer burden class was RCB one. Next slide. And so as per AJCC, it would have been staged as YPT one. A, N0, M0 with uh, and it multiple because there were two foci, whereas the RCB index, it was class one. Next slide, please. So to conclude, a pathological complete response is a valuable predictor of enhanced oncological outcome. That is the disease piece survival and overall survival. And uh, PCR is a sensitive biomarker of survival in HER2 positive breast cancer. Patients achieving complete pathological response have reduced, reduced risk of any recurrence or mortality. And it is a valid analytical endpoint for future prospective oncology trials. PCR can aid patient prognostication in the era of personalized medicine. And I think this is my last slide. I'd like to thank the organizers for giving me this opportunity. Thank you, Dr. Vanilla. That was a very nice presentation. Just one question I wanted to ask that uh, you had the transformation of HER2, uh, ISC2 and ISC1. They converted into negative more. Were they uh, part sir, of... One, one and uh, not even two, one converted into zero, few, but zero became one like that. But three plus and two plus, uh, uh, not many cases converted to uh, one plus or zero. Yeah. Were the uh, uh, two plus uh, fish positive, which converted to uh, negative? Uh, sir, that I don't know. Uh, yeah. I have not gone so much in detail in that. Article. So okay, thank you very much. Yeah. And uh, there is a shortage of time. We'll keep uh, questions for uh, the last. So now we have a uh, next speaker. Uh, we have an international speaker uh, with us, uh, and uh, he's uh, he'll be talking on pathological CR.
versus residual disease in HER2 positive early breast cancer. Uh, it's a, a landmark endpoint impacting the outcome. So we have uh, today with us uh, Dr. Abhinir Mittal. He is currently a staff medical oncologist at Health Sciences um, in Ontario, uh, Canada. And uh, his special interest is in uh, the breast, lung, and GU cancer. And uh, he did his uh, medical oncology training from All India Institute of uh, Medical Sciences, New Delhi. And fellowship he did uh, in uh, breast, GU, and thoracic oncology at Princess Margaret Cancer uh, Center in Toronto. He's a health services researcher with a special interest in real world evidence, global oncology, quality of life, toxicity of anti cancer drugs, and generating evidence to optimize treatment for patient. So uh, welcome Dr. Uh, uh, Abhinil and uh, kindly start with your lecture. Hello, uh, can you hear me okay? Yes. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Kukur and Dr. Rajeshri for inviting me. Uh, I am unsure if I truly classify as an international speaker. I hail from Ambala, 45 minutes from Chandigarh. Okay. And I've spent, I've spent my entire life there. And I just came to Canada a couple of years ago. But uh, thank you for the invitation. Uh, let me just share my screen. Uh, give me one second. Should, uh, have you enabled share, screen share for, my, for me or... We can't, we can't see your screen. Just give me one second. <clears throat> you should be able to see it now. Is it yeah. visible now? Yes. Okay, very good. Okay, uh, so uh, I will uh, be speaking about uh, PCR as a landmark endpoint in HER2 positive early breast cancer and its imp impact on long term outcome. So I'm currently a staff medical oncologist at Health Sciences North in Sudbury and an assistant professor in the Division of Clinical Sciences at the Northern Ontario School of Medicine. So uh, over the next 15 minutes, we'll go through what PCR means, uh, what is the importance of PCR in HER2 positive breast cancer, data for, from some recent randomized trials. How do we tailor adjuvant treatments according to PCR? Uh, what is beyond PCR in HER2 positive breast cancer? What are some of the controversies uh, surrounding PCR? And what are some other biomarkers that we can uh, look forward to? So this is uh, just a general treatment algorithm on how, we, how do we manage HER2 positive early breast cancer in 2023. Uh, most of you uh, would be familiar with this. So in general, uh, somebody with a small HER2 positive early breast cancer, less than one centimeter, would usually go for upfront surgery, followed by adjuvant chemotherapy. If they are still stage one, usually less than less than two centimeters, it is reasonable to offer uh, de-escalated chemotherapy with the apt regimen of paclitaxel plus trastuzumab. Anybody with a higher, uh, higher, a higher tumor size or with lymph node positivity would usually offer multi-agent chemotherapy with or without anthracyclines. I would not go into that debate in my presentation, I believe we have another talk on how to optimally manage her to positive breast cancer uh, coming up. Uh, somebody who, if there is, if the tumor size is in between or more than two centimeters, you would usually go for new adjuvant chemotherapy with either, again, anthracycline or non anthracycline based with anti HER2 therapy, either with trastuzumab, uh, plus minus pertuzumab. If you look down, then the, the management algorithm then divides and is based on if the patient achieves a pathological complete response or not. <clears throat> Sorry, uh, with the ability to tailor adjuvant treatments based on the achievement of PCR. Uh, that is where the importance of PCR comes from, from a treatment perspective. And it also has prognostic implications, as we shall see. Uh, how do we define PCR in breast cancer? So basically, uh, post-surgery, if there is no residual disease in the breast, and there is no nodal disease in the axilla. That is that has that is the conventional definition. There is ideally, uh, if they, that is that is how we would usually define it now. Uh, absence of any residual invasive disease is uh, non-invasive residual disease allowed. So if there is any evidence of DCIS in the breast, but there is no invasive residual disease, then that should also be considered PCR. Uh, there are some infiltrate, if there is presence of no invasive disease in the breast, but there are presence of some isolated tumor cells, that should also be, con also, also be considered 
the PCR. A bit of a controversy is whether you consider microscopic residual disease as PCR or not. And the data on that is not very clear. In general, the prognostic significance of microscopic residual disease is clear. And whether tailoring or escalate adjuvant treatment in that setting is beneficial or not is also unclear. And we shall see some data to that later on in the presentation. Uh, these are some of the these are some of some data to uh, to uh, highlight what we can achieve in terms of new adjuvant treatments and PCR with different types of treatment regimens in her to positive breast cancer. With chemotherapy alone, the PCR rate is around fifty to twenty percent with anthocyclines and vaccines. If you add single agent trastuzumab to that, we can probably double that to about forty percent. Addition of pertuzumab to single agent chemotherapy uh, in the new sphere data was about forty five percent. But if we if we do uh, anthocyclines and taxanes with trastuzumab and pertuzumab, uh, as as it was done in the Trifena study, uh, the PCR rates were in the range of about 60%. Uh, the recent trials which have tried to eliminate anthocyclines like Christine, uh, Train2, Cherlop, uh, most of them have reported PATCRs in a similar range. Uh, we do not have head-to-head -head data comparing an anthocycline versus a non-anthocycline approach, and therefore, the uh, most of the debate about omission of anthocyclines is based on cross-trial comparisons, and hence, that's why I said I would probably stay away from it and leave that for the next presentation. However, the topic for today for me is to why do we care about PCR? So, as I said, either we, whether we do an anthocycline or we do not do an anthocycline, we can probably achieve a PCR in her positive breast cancer in about 60% of patients, which is a good number. Uh, and why do we care about it so much is because PCR is clearly prognostic. Uh, that has been shown across multiple trials as well as meta-analysis from multiple randomized trials. This was the seminal paper by Dr. Minkwitz in 2012, published in GCO, where they did an, where they did an individual patient-level meta-analysis from seven, uh, seven randomized trials, showing that uh, patients who achieved PCR had a better disease-free survival, both in patients who were HER2 positive and in patients who had triple negative breast cancer. Uh, I have not shown a figure here for hormone receptor positive breast cancer, but there was essentially no difference whether you achieved a PCR or not in patients who were hormone receptor positive. Uh, this was an updated meta-analysis by, by Cortez Avital in 2014 in The Lancet, which showed similar findings. Uh, the curves were split very nicely in patients who were HER2 positive and in patients who were triple negative. The differences were not so large in patients who were hormone receptor positive, especially if they were HER2 negative. These are some of the recent randomized trials uh, which have been published in HER2 positive breast cancers, which have utilized anti-HER2 therapy. And if you look at the three-year DFS across these trials in patients who have achieved PCR, it has ranged between 88 to 97%, with 97% being uh, the DFS in some of the more recent studies. Uh, we know from uh, recent, we know from uh, recent meta-analysis as well, that three-year DFS is a good surrogate for overall survival in the adjuvant setting. So uh, three-year DFS is a good endpoint in general. In patients who do not achieve a PCR, uh, they do have a significantly inferior outcome uh, in terms of, uh, in terms of uh, both DFS, which would likely translate to a significant overall survival outcome. We do not have data on overall survival for a lot of these studies so far. And remember that this, this is PCR versus not PCR. Again, this is not pertuzumab versus no pertuzumab, which I'm not getting into, but this is PCR versus no PCR. So clearly, achievement of PCR is prognostic. And if patients achieve PCR, they do better than those who do not achieve PCR. Uh, based on these meta-analyses, there have been recent pooled analysis and recent meta-analysis, which continue to show similar findings, which were shown in the earlier meta-analysis that PCR continues to remain prognostic, even with current dual anti-HER2 targeted therapies, both for EFS as well as for overall survival. And the findings are consistent across stages. So both stage two, a lot of those would be negative. And, and stage three, a lot of those would be more positive with very similar, very similar hazard issues. Uh, this is also consistent across hormone receptor positivity, although the, although the magnitude of effect is as expected higher in patients who are uh, hormone receptor negative than those who are hormone receptor positive. How does PCR help in, uh, in optimizing treatments? So we know the data from Catherine, 
this was the initial analysis which was uh, which which came out uh, now 4 years ago where there was a significant benefit in invasive disease free survival in patients uh, where uh, trastuzumab was replaced by tdm1 in those who do, do not did not achieve a pcr with new adjuvant therapy at that time there was no benefit in overall survival uh this data was updated a uh, few days ago at san antonio breast cancer symposium where uh, the absolute idfs benefit persisted at 7 years with a 13% absolute benefit in disease free survival which is significant and uh it's now 7 year follow up and as i mentioned just previously dfs in the adjuvant setting is usually a good uh surrogate for overall survival and uh they did show an overall survival benefit as well of about 4.7% at 7 years lesser in magnitude than idfs which is expected but still a significant benefit uh there are still there are still other ongoing studies in the post new adjuvant setting because so i'm going back to the last slide because even at 7 years there are about 11% of patients who are in the tdm1 arm who have had an event uh therefore there is obviously room for improvement uh, and there we still haven't reached any plateaus here like we classically see in the immunotherapy curve so you know uh, clearly patients are having events and clearly patients are still dying so there is room for improvement and that's why there are still ongoing studies trying to improve upon adjuvant tdm1 looking at adding atezolizumab with tdm1 tdm1 plus tocatinib or replacing tdm1 with inher2 and we await these results to see whether we can further improve on tdm1 in the adjuvant setting so conclusion so far uh, pcr is prognostic for individual patient outcomes in her to positive early breast cancer both for efs and ofs note the word individual uh, with current treatments uh, 50 to 60% of patients can achieve a pcr anthracycline versus no anthracycline remains debatable uh, there is no head to head data cross trial comparisons show similar outcomes and adjuvant tdm1 long term outcomes look robust especially for idfs however let's dig a little deeper uh, less than pcr doesn't necessarily mean that all patients who does don't have a pcr will uh, relapse uh, and pcr doesn't guarantee a cure so i said three year outcomes for patients who have a pcr are bit around 90 to 95% they're not 100% so not everybody with a pcr is never going to relapse they still do relapse so pcr and no pcr is probably a bit too simplistic it's not so black and white but there is a lot of gray in between so if you look at the catherine idfs subgroup analysis which was presented at san antonio you still uh, uh, in patients who have residual disease you can see that the extent of residual disease matters uh, so you it is it is probably not right to club all of those patients together into one umbrella of, of not having pcr Uh, Dr. Sharma mentioned in a presentation that you know uh, that extent of residual disease matters, and that is what that is what essentially I'm trying to say as well. So if you look at patients with N3 disease, their outcomes with trastuzumab were 32%, with TDM1 were 38%. So they do badly, regardless of what we do in the adjuvant setting, suggesting that a lot of these patients all likely already have mitometastatic disease, and we're not curing them essentially. So. similarly if you look at the overall survival analysis in the catherine trial uh, if you look at those patients who have a residual disease of less than 1 cm with negative axillary nodes their seven year overall survival outcomes are 93% with trastuzumab and 92% with tdm1 potentially these are some patients who probably who probably had an event because of tdm1 toxicity rather than having any potential benefits from tdm1 so again not all patients with residual disease do badly and not all patients with residual disease do as well so it's not a it's not a uniform subgroup so we probably need something better than just pcr and no pcr i think rcb or residual cancer burden is one such parameter dr sharma already highlighted all of this very well in her presentation uh, there are and there have been a number of studies which have looked at the prognostic value of residual cancer burden it looks at tumor cellularity uh, the size of the tumor bed number of lymph nodes and then tells us uh, and then gives us an rcb class the pcr being rcb0 and then 1 2 and 3 based on the score uh, and th- this is prognostic across tumor types so like i mentioned pcr doesn't give us a lot of prognostic information in patients who are hormone receptor positive it's good for patients who are her2 positive and triple negative however from whatever data we have so far for rcb it is prognostic in patients who have hormone receptor positive triple negative or her2 positive disease so 
probably may be better than PCR. We'll have to see whether this is validated in, in the upcoming studies in, the, uh, in, in clinical trials. Uh, so there is a, the studies going on, for example, the Fergain 2 study, which is kind of doing a similar thing where based on the extent of vegetable disease, physicians can choose whether patients can or cannot get adjuvant chemotherapy. It's a chemotherapy-free trial in the new adjuvant setting, but based on the extent of vegetable disease, there's an option to get chemotherapy later. So, you know, kind of trying to recognize that uh, the extent of residual disease matters and clubbing all non-PCRs together is probably not the right thing. The other controversy surrounding PCR is whether it is a good trial level surrogate. Uh, so we know that we've already seen that it is a very good individual level surrogate and uh, there is, it is an excellent prognostic marker in trials. However, there has been a lot of debate over the past many years uh, in the breast cancer community as to whether PCR should be used for drug approvals. Uh, pertuzumab has been approved in the US for almost 10 years now. It was approved in 2013, I believe, uh, based on the fact that it improved PCR uh, improved PCR rates. But there, has, there have never been any conclusive data to suggest that adding pertuzumab improves either disease-free survival or overall survival in the new adjuvant setting. Even in the adjuvant setting, there has never been an overall survival benefit for pertuzumab. Now, the obvious question is that if PCR is so prognostic and if there is a drug that improves PCR to a good extent, how come it is not effective at a trial level and why is it not improving outcomes at a trial level? So there is a surrogate survival gap when it comes to a lot of these endpoints. Uh, and there are three major reasons why that happened. One is uh, there are direct treatment effects on survival independent of the effect on a surrogate endpoint, for example, and any anti her to therapy does improve PCR in patients with early breast cancer, but it also directly improves survival because we know in the metastatic setting, anti her to therapy with either pertuzumab or pertuzumab has an impact on breast cancer survival. So if you look at the figure above, basically treatment is improving survival itself. So it is potentially confounding the direct impact that the treatment has on the, on, on the surrogate endpoint. There are other confounding factors which the analysis of any of these trials cannot, cannot account for because there are always some unknown confounders. So although PCR is an independent prognostic factor for OS, there are other factors which influence PCR and OS, for example, tumor size, nodal status, age, et cetera. And then there are surrogate directed treatment changes. For example, a number of patients in those trials, which were, they are followed till their surgery and the new adjuvant. But what they get in the adjuvant setting is often outside the purview of the study. And a lot of the time, the investigators would choose to escalate adjuvant treatments based on the fact that those patients did not achieve a PCR. And that can affect survival. So that is probably why we see a surrogate survival gap in a lot of these studies. And that's one of the reasons for the controversy surrounding PCR. And this, is, this has been shown multiple times. This was a paper published last year where the middle line, the dotted line is one, where there is a perfect surrogate, versus, where there's one which suggests that the correlation is perfect uh, in between the surrogate endpoint and the uh, primary endpoint, which is OS. But you can see that, you know, PCR is neither here nor there. Uh, the hazard, the R square, which is the coefficient of correlation, which we typically measure for EFS, it's 0.38, which is weak correlation. For OS, it's 0 0.01, which suggests that there is actually no correlation at a trial level again. So we, there are some other biomarkers which we can look for uh, in this setting. Uh, Dr. Sharma again mentioned that there is HER2 loss or, you know, at least HER2 degradation, which happens after neoadjuvant therapy, which is important prognostically. Uh, and those patients who have a HER2 loss do worse. Not all centers repeat biomarkers on the post uh, on the post surgical specimen. Uh, in patients in patients who have upfront surgery, th I think that's okay. But in patients who have neoadjuvant chemotherapy, I think it should be standard of care to repeat biomarkers on the post surgical specimen, both to provide prognostic information as well as for treatment decision making. Then they respect response. We've all we all. A lot of us may be familiar with the Fergain study where they looked at pet response and then depending upon whether the patient was pet sensitive or pet resistant, escalated or not escalated treatment. And they showed that the results were very similar. It was a single arm phase two study, but the DFS rate was 95.4%. The 
chemotherapy free approach free approach based on pet response so it's 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 feasible and something that can be used in in future studies there's something also called as her to dx which is a genomic test for early stage breast cancer looks at four uh, gene amplification in uh, gene signatures from an immune her to amplicon proliferation and luminal differentiation standpoint also looks at t stage and n stage and provides a score uh, there's a risk score which which basically tells us what is the likelihood of recurrence and there is a pcr score which tells us what is the likelihood of this patient achieving a pcr there have been some studies uh, which have proposed to use it as a tool to decide treatment in the sense that if the patient has a high chance of pcr maybe a, a lesser or de escalated chemotherapy regimen may be useful we need it needs to be mentioned that there is no prospective validation of this score as yet all the data are retrospective done on data sets from randomized trials so, so this needs to be prospectively validated before we can uh, before it before being used uh, routinely and it's not available routinely it's basically being done on uh, trial subsets so overall uh, pcr is an excellent individual prognostic marker in her to positive breast cancer and correlates with long term outcomes however achievement of pcr does not mean cure and not all patients with residual disease have poor outcomes as well uh trial level surrogacy of pcr for efs or os is not proven and its regulatory utility is still uncertain uh better biomarkers based on rcb uh ctdna or genomic risk may help guide future decisions rather than uh pcr alone uh thank you happy to take any questions and uh that's my email if there are any other questions after thank you the, dr mithil that was uh, fantastic uh presentation a very difficult uh, topic i mean uh, so many trials have uh, been done i mean they are doing it for last two decades and still they don't uh, find the difference in overall survival uh, in pcr uh, especially in uh, her2 positive uh, disease i mean it is difficult to uh, because every time we say that you are going to live longer but has it uh, shown actually that the survival advantage is there so uh, as i said if the patient achieves a pcr they are likely to live longer if they don't achieve a pcr so at a patient level it is definitely prognostic so when we usually talk to patients we would tell them that you know it is it is okay to do everything to try and achieve a pcr and that's where i think pertuzumab or I, you know trying to escalate new adjuvant treatments is useful but whether the i think the question comes as to uh you know when your uh, india is a bit different because you know most patients would pay privately for pertuzumab if they have to uh, other health systems are different say in us it's a, it's a bit of another question you know whether the insurance pays for it or not in canada it's a different system because the public system has to pay for it so that's where the controversy is whether you know the regulatory authorities or what do they do for it because at a trial level or at a health system level it doesn't improve outcomes because of all the confounding factors which i showed you so pcr is definitely prognostic for an individual patient and if they achieve that they definitely do better than those who have a significant residual disease i am i am unsure if say there is microscopic residual disease their outcomes are any different from those who achieve a pcr but for others who have say significant residual disease nodal residual disease they definitely do worse than those who have pcr there is no question about it Okay, so, uh, Doctor Abinil, uh, I have a question. Uh, yeah. So, first of all, an excellent presentation. So, thank you. My first first question is: uh, Do you routinely do uh, again the biomarker testing on a post surgery specimen in your practice? Because usually we don't do it. And number two, in your histopathological specimens or histopathological reports, do you get that RCB score that Doctor Anila mentioned, and you also have mentioned in your talk? so uh, the answer to the first question is yes uh, we would usually uh, request for so our pathologist would they would not do it routinely but we would usually ask for it uh, in uh, especially in patients who have received new adjuvant we are trying to standardize it so that you know they give it give it to us routinely they don't give the rcb score because again the uh, utility of it at this time for treatment decision making is uncertain we know it is prognostic but we wouldn't change our decisions based on it Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, should we proceed to our next uh, topic? Yes, yeah, sir. Please. Thank you. Yeah.
we have uh, dr christian jakish with us sorry we we have we, we have session 2 so, so we have session 2 from okay. uh, surgery Okay. So uh, we'll be uh, next topic is early breast cancer, oncosurgeon perspective and uh, current approach. And uh, speaker will be our colleague from uh, Chandigarh, Dr. Naval Bansal. He's uh, he'll be talking on uh, he's giving his surgical perspective. Dr. Naval. Uh, yes. Uh, hi. Good evening, everyone. Uh, 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 I, I will be sharing how we usually approach. Uh, uh, early breast cancer patients, uh, uh, there is no doubt it's a systemic disease to begin with and the PCR is considered as a, uh, one of the prognostic markers, uh, how the patient behave. So uh, the lots of things have changed over uh, past uh, decade in the surgical aspects, uh, how as a surgeon we deal with it. So I am sharing my screen just. <clears throat> uh, is my screen visible, sir? Yes, yes, it is yes. visible. <clears throat> so I will be uh, basically uh, touching upon the what are the practical approach, how we usually see uh, when we see a patient of early breast cancer and how our approach changed over the last decade. Sorry, I cannot change. Okay. So what, what are the changes that uh, as a surgeon or as an oncosurgeon I have seen over the period? First is the sequence of surgery, which has taken over a drastic change over the past decade. Earlier, uh, only locally advanced uh, breast cancer was, uh, was receiving uh, neoadjuvant chemotherapy, but definitely uh, with the newer uh, studies, uh, uh, HER2 positive and triple negative breast cancers are, even in early breast cancers, they are the candidates for neoadjuvant chemotherapy. Second comes the extent of surgeries. Uh, these days, the less is more. Uh, now, uh, the no longer uh, radical surgeries are preferred, especially for breast cancer patients. Uh, I am wondering and uh, uh, research is going on if the surgery is actually required uh, in a patient who actually received a clinical uh, complete response with the uh, uh, neoadjuvant chemotherapy. So as a surgeon, uh, when we uh, encounter a patient of early breast cancer, so uh, what is our first approach? First, uh, it's to make a decision uh, whether the patient is uh, requiring neoadjuvant chemotherapy or whether is a candidate for upfront surgery. Uh, definitely, as mentioned by my previous speakers, the patient uh, uh, who are triple negative and uh, HER2 positive disease are candidates uh, irrespective of uh, T1 or N1 disease. Uh, they are majority of them are candidates for neoadjuvant chemotherapy. And definitely second uh, uh, scenario is when the patient is uh, has to be taken up for upfront surgery. Uh, just skipping this slide, uh, I'm sure everybody is knowing. Uh, as a surgeon, uh, because uh, if we are planning for a neoadjuvant chemotherapy or uh, uh, upfront surgery, these are the basic evaluation as a surgeon I would like to uh, go ahead with. First is the mammography. I feel this is the most neglected imaging modalities in the era of PET that we are neglecting. Mammography is essential as a surgeon because it picks up microcalcifications and it is a, a marker for uh, ductal carcinoma in situ. It's uh, uh, change my it can change my planning uh, whether the patient is candidate for conservation or mastectomy. Second comes a, a dedicated ultrasound of the axilla. Uh, we have to assess the nodal status whether uh, if we are going for a neoadjuvant chemotherapy whether the it's a N1 disease or N0 disease. Uh, thus, uh, basic uh, again. Uh, this is lacking in majority of our center. Dedicated ultrasound is required. Uh, if the cortical thickness is more than th 3 millimeter or there is loss of fatty hilum, it uh, indicates uh, that uh, nodes may be involved. If there is a suspicion of uh, nodal uh, involvement in an early breast cancer, uh, the nodes need to be biopsied and uh, needs to be clipped if we were planning for a sentinel lymph node biopsy at a later stage. Uh, PET scan again is a, our institutional protocol and uh, as a surgeon I would like to go for a breast MRI in case the breast is dense and or uh, we found a multifocal disease or uh, on a uh, routine uh, mammogram or a PET scan. So a decision has to be make, uh, made before uh, starting chemotherapy that uh, eventually this patient will be needing going for a breast conservation or that patient is going for a mastectomy at later stage. Uh, there are certain uh, indications that uh, when we uh, ask the patient, that patient will be uh, in, uh, in needing a mastectomy in an early breast cancer. If it is a multicentric disease, 
uh, there is a extensive ductal carcinoma in situ component on uh, mammogram patient un unwilling for conservation okay. and patient has a uh, mutation a genetic testing positive multifocal breast lesions is a not a contraindication for conservation at a later stage in those uh, scenario we usually clip the, both the lesions but again the intent is to uh, make the uh, cosmetic outcome optimal at at the same time uh, removing the tumor so, uh, as a surgeon, uh, when the patient is uh, uh, going for a neoadjuvant chemotherapy, uh, it's a very important to mark the lesion with a, a clip because at a later stage, when there is a no residual disease, it's a difficult uh, uh, to take out the uh, the area of interest. Uh, so, lab guru or our parent and the electrician there. Kindly mute your, uh, mute yourself, uh, listeners. Please mute yourself. So, uh, so for the early breast cancer patient, uh, uh, the tumor mapping is important. At the later uh, stage, we can uh, definitely uh, do a, a viral localization and take out the tumor for a assessment, pathological assessment, whether it's a pathological complete response or it's a partial complete response. Uh, second comes as a surgeon, again, the axillary staging become also important, whether we are going for a neoadjuvant chemotherapy or whether we are going for a adjuvant uh, 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 or upfront surgery. So, axillary staging, uh, if we are going for a neoadjuvant chemotherapy, if it is an N0 disease uh, based on the previous workup with the ultrasound and uh, uh, mammogram or PET scan, if it is an N0 disease, definitely after neoadjuvant chemotherapy, uh, we can go for a, a, a sentinel lymph node biopsy. Uh, the standard of care uh, of sentinel lymph node biopsy is with the dual uh, technique uh, uh, with the methylene glue or gamma probe or there are other modalities also uh, like indocyanin green is uh, again becoming uh, popular these days but again uh, it's a surgeon's preference so sentinel lymph node biopsy is the standard in N0 disease if it is N1 disease to, to start with and we are giving for a uh, pre chemo uh, we are going for a neoadjuvant chemotherapy so all those nodes needs to be clipped and uh, later on, uh, if we are planning for a sentinel lymph node biopsy, at least three lymph nodes has to be taken out and the clipped nodes needs to be removed. But again, uh, I am I'm, I'm, uh, I'm, uh, uh, unsure uh, whether uh, majority of our centers are uh, not doing it because uh, majority of uh, centers abroad are using a magnetic clip and they have a dedicated machine who can pick up these uh, previously labeled nodes. But uh, as uh, our institutional policy or uh, what, what we are doing is, if it is an N1 disease, uh, we are usually uh, doing a formal axillary clearance. But if it is N0 disease, again, the uh, sentinel lymph node biopsy is a standard of care. In N1 uh, a disease, the main uh, concern is to uh, have more false negative rates. Uh, the false negative rate should be less than 10% if we are going for a sentinel lymph node biopsy. Uh, Again, uh, like I mentioned, the uh, less is more. Uh, even if the sentinel lymph nodes uh, up to two nodes are positive, we can very well skip the axillary lymph nodal dissection because there is no survival difference in uh, uh, full axillary clearance versus uh, sentinel lymph node biopsy. There are definitely certain criteria when we can skip or when not, when we cannot uh, skip. Uh, Micrometastasis is of no significance. Uh, and we doesn't want any further axillary uh, uh, surgery. Uh, if we are going for a upfront uh, uh, surgery, so breast conservation surgery with the oncoplasty is the standard of care, uh, especially in early breast cancer. Uh, conventionally, when we were doing a breast conservation alone, we would tend to leave behind some seroma and the cosmetic results was not up to the marks. Uh, especially the tumors which are located in inner center or lower half of the breast with the large volume section. So these days uh, in early breast cancer, uh, breast conservation with the oncoplasty is the standard of care. Definitely there are uh, various uh, techniques we can use for uh, different quadrants. I'm not, uh, again, this is a one another aspect that I want to highlight. Earlier, the central quadrant tumor was considered as a Contraindication for uh, breast conservation surgery, but this is not no longer true. Definitely, we can have uh, this Grisotti flap technique, which is important, uh, good technique for central quadrant tumor. Again, uh, the very these are the various uh, oncoplastic techniques which are available. This is a flap uh, which we are using uh, for a breast reconstruction. This is a 
uh, uh, perforator flap this doesn't take uh, muscle along with and there is a less morbidity so uh, uh, the the standard of care in early breast cancer is the conservation uh, with sentinel lymph node biopsy and uh, how we usually assess the margins if it is a pure invasive breast cancer uh, the dictum is there should be no ink on the tumor there is nothing like we take a one centimeter margin or two centimeter margin there should be no ink on the tumor if it is a ductal carcinoma in situ definitely two millimeter margin is the uh, standard of care and the safe margins again uh, uh, if it is a very small tumor the conservation still stand to so the take home message uh, from a surgical aspect uh, when we are dealing with a early uh, early breast cancer who are uh, very tiny uh, and, and earlier we were doing for uh, going for upfront surgeries but these days the pre operative planning if we are going for a chemotherapy is very very important because we cannot uh, do like uh, uh, give chemo first and then we'll decide whether the patient is candidate for mastectomy or not so pre uh, chemo planning is very very important and uh, followed by conservation and sentinel lymph node biopsy with or without reconstruction so uh, so that's all from a uh, surgeon's perspective uh, i'm happy to take any questions if any Uh, sir, you are mute. Dr. Rajeshwar, sir, you are mute. Okay, thank you, uh, Dr. Bansal. That was a wonderful uh, presentation. And uh, if there are any question by anyone who wants to ask some question. So, uh, sir, uh, just a question that uh, uh, what is your take on the marker that we put in the breast as well as in the axilla? Because at times there are issues with displacement, particularly in the axilla. What do you do? Is it clipping what, beforehand, before start of new adjuvant in an early stage? Uh, sir, like I mentioned, uh, 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 you need a dedicated uh, radiologist uh, for assessment of the axillary lymph node. In our uh, setup, usually... Uh, uh, very few centers maybe in India are putting the pre uh, neurojuvent uh, uh, clipping in the nodes because uh, the putting clips is not an issue. Uh, detection of these clips uh, during the time of surgery is uh, a real challenge because how will you find out these uh, lymph, lymph nodes which have been clipped earlier. So in abroad or UK, they are putting a magnetic clips and... Uh, sorry. So... So they are putting a magnetic clip and uh, with the help of uh, there is a dedicated machine uh, with which they uh, pick up these uh, magnetic clips uh, because there is sensor on it. Otherwise, it's uh, difficult to put a clip and uh, uh, identify those nodes uh, later on. So as a routine practice, uh, we are usually doing uh, in N1 disease who are pre-operatively pre uh, pre-chemotherapy. Uh, the axillary clearance uh, is the standard these days if uh, uh, we are not able to clip the nodes. And secondly, you very well mentioned in your talk that uh, central quadrant tumor that were considered. Any experience on that central quadrant tumor? So definitely, a central quadrant tumor is not, no longer a contraindication for uh, mess, uh, breast conservation. The outcome is similar. There is no nothing like if it is a behind the nipple areola complex the outcome is inferior. There is nothing like that. There are uh, lots of oncoplastic techniques are there, uh, which we are using, like I showed in the, my slide. It's a Grisotti flap technique. Definitely, you can reconstruct the nipple and the uh, outcome is uh, fantastic, sir. Uh, any experience on uh, uh, having uh, doing the breast conservation surgery, particularly when the skin is involved, when it is a T4 tumor and the patient has undergone new adjuvant chemotherapy? Uh, sir, definitely, in uh, after new adjuvant chemotherapy, there is uh, uh, definitely uh, you can do a conservation, but you need to select your patient very carefully. Uh, uh, standard uh, conservation after new adjuvant chemotherapy again becoming uh, standard of care. But if it is an extensive skin involvement, definitely uh, because you cannot pathological label that whether the skin is free or not. Uh, if it is a limited skin involvement, you definitely you can uh, do a conservation. But it, if it is an extensive skin involvement, I usually consider if it is more than one third of uh, breast uh, skin in, is involved, definitely the ladies uh, candidates for uh, mastectomy. But if it is a limited 
a small area of skin involvement, definitely the breast can be saved. So. But that decision has to be taken post nuvertin, or you decided like one third of the area of the skin. Sir, uh, if if it is a more than one of the th one third of the breast tissue is involved uh, before chemotherapy, definitely later on the patient will be going for a mastectomy, irrespective of the response. But if it is a limited skin involvement uh, to start with, definitely the breast can be saved. But again, it has to be reassessed after chemotherapy. Thank you, Dr. Naval. Thank you. Yes. Thank you, Dr. Naval. We uh, now proceed to the next international speaker uh, talk we have. Today we have uh, Dr. J uh, Christian Jackish. He is a professor uh, and head of department of OBS and Gy uh, Gynecology and director of the Breast and Gynecological Cancer uh, uh, Center at Sana Clinic, Offenbach, Germany. So I'll request uh, Dr. Jackish, he'll be talking on dual uh, blockage of uh, new adjuvant and adjuvant uh, treatment of early br uh, breast cancer. Dr. Jackish, please. I'm here. Can you hear me? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. We can. Can you me. see my slides? Yes, we can. Perfect. Are you happy? Very, very happy. <laughs> <laughs> okay, guys. So um, thank you so much for having me. Um, you know, I have been traveling India for uh, at least four times in the last couple of years, and I just enjoy it. But unfortunately, uh, there was no chance to join you uh, personally. So I'm very grateful uh, by Rosh and yourself that you are just taking your time for sharing with me some thoughts about the early breast cancer treatment um, dual blockade. And uh, I have prepared some slides here and uh, would like to happy, be happy to share that. So the topic I would like to cover is the dual blockade treatment of neoadjuvant and adjuvant therapy in uh, early breast cancer. And I'm sitting here physically, um, whatever, 10 minutes away from the Frankfurt airport uh, and uh, in my office. And uh, you're going to see the skyline of uh, Frankfurt and everybody who ever touched ground here in Frankfurt knows where I'm sitting. So these are my disclosures. What I have put together for you guys is the timing of surgery and systemic therapy in the HER2 classic positive breast cancer world, because you know the HER2 low, ultra low zero is just dedicated to metastatic disease only. And then the neoadjuvant chemotherapy uh, in, with anti-HER2 therapy and adjuvant therapy, anti-HER2 therapy, and maybe some thoughts about the uh, past neoadjuvant um, uh, therapy and everybody who was enjoying the San Antonio breast cancer meeting has listened to Zabila Loyal's presentation that we have the final overall results of the Catherine trial, which is positive first time ever for overall survival. So if you're just going to uh, think uh, the way I'm going to thinking here is that we all were educated in the world, surgery first and then adjuvant treatment. And, uh, and, and, and then we were doing... Um, unbelievable surgery and adjuvant treatment, but the smarter way is when we know that you have an indication for um, ad for systemic treatment, then why don't you do it? Uh, I call this a Pearl Harbor effect that you just surprise a tumor with your uh, missiles of your chemotherapy and you have everything of the infrastructure in place uh, to offer uh, an optimal systemic treatment and then uh, you do surgery, and surgery is nothing else to see how effective was your primary systemic treatment. And then, based on these results, we have the chance of post neoadjuvant uh, systemic therapy. And, and that is a smart way with two decision points. And I touch on that a little bit later that you're just going to consider first of all, is the risk of recurrence that high that you request a neoadjuvant systemic therapy? And then as this simple cartoon is showing here. So in the more sophisticated way, uh, you have the response assessment and in vivo assessment of your response. That's very important. And you can adjust your adjuvant treatment. Um, the surgical approaches are downstaging your tumor, downstaging the workload or surgical um, work and damage in the axilla, decrease surgical mobility and uh, offering the space for reconstructive surgery. But at the end of the day, you have an early treatment of your micrometastasis and this is what is causing your recurrence and maybe then the metastatic disease. 
So what is the evidence saying to us? So we know from the early breast cancer trial, this um, meta-analysis, uh, what you're going to see here, that the timing of your therapy in terms of surgery first or adjuvant treatment with a long-term follow-up of uh, 15 years is not negatively influenced by uh, neoadjuvant treatment. It's, uh, I mean, um, it's an option that you can offer your patients as an alternative. So we're going to start with a neoadjuvant treatment here. Um, this is what we're going to um, offer our patients. So we start on the far left. That was Luca Gianni's um, NOAA trial introducing anti her to treatment and in our HANA trial doing the same thing as subcutaneous administration. And they both have been published in the Lancet and Lancet Oncology in 2010 and 2012. They were just um, offering a uh, uh, um, um, a complete response of about 38 to 39 per percentage. If you go to the far right with the ADAPT trial, also from Germany, we've got to show you a 90.5% um, PCR rate and the, re the rest here from all the trials, and I, I guess all the names are knocking a bell or ringing a bell in your mind that you're something in the range of 50 to 70% of, um, of achieving a PCR if you use trastuzumab and pertuzumab as a dual blockade. So this is the basic armamentarium before Patty Cortada published in 2014, uh, this landmark paper showing that event-free survival and overall survival are linked to the PCR or not PCR situation. Uh, we've seen that FDA was taking that for granted to use a neoadjuvant approach as a fast tech procedure for uh, effective, uh, effectiveness. And then we've learned that in the HER2 world, there are two worlds actually, the pathway, uh, um, the, the triple positives, hormone receptor positive and HER2 positive, and then the HER2 positives and HR negatives. Both are giving rise to the uh, information that whenever you have a HER2 positive uh, breast cancer, that is the driving force. And you would just love, actually, you would love to treat your patients accordingly. So, to make things think evil, if you have a, a risk of recurrence, which is high or low, you're going to go for your patients in the neoadjuvant setting, and high risk is usually tumors bigger than two centimeters in size and or node positive, means histologically proven node ne uh, positive. And then you decide four to eight cycles of a pH-based regimen, whatever that is. So, and then... At the day of surgery, the pathologist is giving you an idea about your risk of recurrence. You have a PCR, no tumor, invasive tumor in the breast and or axilla, or you have invasive cancer in the breast and or axilla, what we call residual disease. And based on this information, at low risk, you can de-escalate your treatment, what I would never do, or you, you, you just go for the completion of your treatment with a dual blockade, which you are just going to start with in the beginning. That's one option. And then for those who have residual invasive disease, as I just mentioned from the Catherine trial, we've seen that there is an overall benefit if you change your anti-HER2 treatment to TDM1 to allow that the patient is completing her treatment for the whole entire time of 12 months. And uh, if you have a low risk of recurrence, this could be a HER2 positive breast cancer patient with a tumor smaller than two centimeters in size and or um, axillary negative. So then these patients benefit from surgery upfront and then a de-escalated chemotherapy, which is 12 times paclitaxel weekly and only trastuzumab. And that is the best way for those with low risk of recurrence. And then based on that, you decide on your adjuvant treatment. And that is, you can read the slide by yourself, uh, trastuzumab-based combination, um, or even, even if you are just have a mismatch that, that your tumor is bigger than two centimeters size and or it's not positive, then you can use the uh, dual blockade uh, for the completion for one year in the adjuvant setting. So adjuvant setting is very important based on your risk of recurrence. And that is in the neoadjuvant setting, very simple. It is uh, a non-PCR. 
And then on top of that, in those patients with the hormone receptor positive and HER2 positive disease, you can add on naritinib for one year in this population and all patients with a hormone responsive cancer will receive the treatment for the completion of five years according to the standards. So this is what you put on the back of your beer tap and, and you're safe in the treatment of HER2 positive disease. Everything you can do has a rationale, but you have to do it with a rationale behind that and that's okay. So the good thing is that we have high risk of responses, but we know that we have also patients, even if they had a PCR, that they might relapse. So what is to do with these patients or how could we change or optimize the neoadjuvant treatment? That's a key question here. So the recommendations for the post-neoadjuvant treatment, we have just alluded to that, is TDM1. And unfortunately, what we've seen here is what is crossing my mind, the second checkpoint, checkpoint procedure. So if I have a HER2 positive disease and I know this tumor is bigger than two centimeters in size and or not negative, these are candidates for neoadjuvant treatment. That is chemotherapy number one. Then at the day of surgery, my pathologist is possible and uh, the possible source for letting me know is this a PCR or a non-PCR. And based on this result of the efficacy, I'm just considering with the patient and my interdisciplinary tumor board, what is actually the stuff we would like to offer those patients. So the Casserine trial with a non-PCR after the neoadjuvant treatment decided to give patients after surgery and then for the completion of one year, trastuzumab. And this trial is positive. You know, the, the numbers haven't changed. They have been published by Gunther von Minkwitz in 2019. Uh, and, and we've seen hormone receptor positives with the, the biggest cohort of more than 70% versus ER negative and PR negative. And then also 10% of these patients or 19% received tristuzumab plus an additional anti-HER2 treatment option. And this has been the old data from 19, 11.3% uh, difference whatsoever. Uh, that, that, that has been topped in San Antonio, the final analysis. But what I want to show you here, based on the publication of 2019, that you're going to see a difference in the um, invasive disease-free survival, which you actually are looking for in the setting of the adjuvant situation. You can see also that you have an impact, an impact of the uh, time to first offspring of met metastatic disease, and overall survival was negative at that time point, but now, believe me, it's positive. So the, this putting, uh, Catherine is putting um, new insight into the scenario based on the decision point, surgery. P, uh, PCR and non-PCR are different kind of maneuvers. And you're going to see this here, TM1, or the maintenance of your given previous treatment. So we have been uh, in the position to publish, and Sandra Swain was the first author, to ask ourselves a question, and you can see this from the author's list. We were took, putting together all the trials, Hannah, Neosphere, Trifina, Benaris, and Christine trial to see if we're going to start in the neoadjuvant setting with age only, followed by age in the post-surgical situation, or you start with a dual blockade and then de-escalate to age only, or you start with a dual blockade and after surgery, you maintain this treatment options, what will be the benefit? So these are the total numbers of those patients. And you're gonna see that the median follow-up was ranging from 61.3% to 71.6%. Uh, and to make a long story short, you see the overall PCR rate was 43.8%. But the driver here is not the H followed by H group. This is only 33.6%. And it is mainly not the pH followed by H group. It is pH followed by pH. This is the driver. And you're going to see that translates in four years event-free survival. 
uh, the monotherapy was 46%, and then in the dual blockade, it ranges up to 87%. So what is my take-home message here? Never, ever change a winning team. And you're going to see the results here for event-free survival for stage one, stage two, and you see this for lymph node positive or lymph node negative. So the lymph node status is a prognostic indicator, and the rest is predictive, showing that regardless of your stage of disease, you are just benefiting from this kind of treatment. And there's the same thing for hormone receptor positive and hormone receptor negative. But you're going to see here very simple in the um, hormone receptor positives that the difference in between the blue and the red line is based on the endocrine treatment, which was traveling along with this chemotherapy. Okay. So the striking point here is the difference in between the blue line and the red line is the smallest when you just treat with a dual blockade followed by dual blockade. And that is a key message here. If you do chemotherapy plus uh, anti her treatment, then do it the right way to see that you have a small, tiny difference in between these two lines. And that is your treatment benefit. Okay. So when we just this argue then, can we just, from whatever reason, cultural, whatever reason, um, first surgery and then adjuvant treatment, you know this numbers. And we have seen then data from Sarah Tulaney, recently published in the Lancet Oncology, her tremendous TPH trial, treatment options at early breast cancer meeting. So the adjuvant therapy of her protocol, what you see on top of the slide, is of low risk of recurrence. And that's the reason why you de-escalate your treatment only anti her treatment. And regardless of your receptor status, you don't see a difference. That's what the two Kaplan-Meier graphs are showing here. And then the next question is, are TILTs doing anything? And they're not doing nothing in invasive disease-free survival. Uh, you're going to see those curves that are identical if you just group them in low, medium, and high. And even if you are just going for PAM50 for a more sophisticated te testing, you won't see much differences, which are just guiding you to more or more de-escalation. But on the other hand, we've seen those data at the San Antonio Breast Cancer Meeting uh, in 2022, the attempt trial in her to positive classic disease. And then the question was TDM1 versus TH. And it was very tiny tumors, uh, less than two, uh, five millimeters in size, and then five to one centimeter in size. And, and, and that's something uh, what was very interesting. And if you put this together with all the trials that we have with the small tumors, you're going to see that the small tumors are just responding in 11 invasive disease-free survivals uh, events, distant recurrence three times, non-related deaths three times, but we have to re report this, contralateral her to negative breast cancer, two, uh, three cases, and two ipsilateral recurrences. So this is a major concern we have to face. The five years um, invasive disease-free survival are similar for both groups and also for small and bigger tumors. So Dr. Tarantino stated in his lecture in 2022 at San Antonio meeting, um, there are some analysis you can use to optimize your treatment, but at the end of the day, it's a perfect matchup. So then affinity data is the same thing, adjuvant treatment, and, and, and then you have those tiny small tumors switch to uh, your, uh, your your dual blockade uh, with pertuzumab and trituzumab post-surgically, and then you're going to see what is the outcome. It's very interesting. And the affinity trial at the latest publication in 2021 by Martin Picard is showing that the IDFS and oral survival after six years of follow-up is just shown here, and you're going to see there are no big differences, which are paying the amount of treatment those women are having. And we've seen also that there's a huge tumor burden or burden, emotional burden on those patients when they realize that they have to go through this adjuvant treatment. But these data are showing there is a benefit for a, uh, for a clear group. And that is the numbers with T2 tumors, sorry, with, with, with tumors bigger than two centimeters in size and or node positive disease. So there you would like to do it. No difference whatsoever in the hormone receptor negatives and positives. 
So this is not the way you should look at these data. So, uh, and, and consequently, uh, what you're gonna see here, the additive and treatment options, you have in the node positive and node negative cohort. Yeah, there, there are, uh, sorry for that, there are no other ways of doing this, okay? So, um, sorry for that. On and 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 these are giving us after eight point five years a very good deep dive into the scenario of these patients in this very important trial of the maintenance treatment. And if you are sitting in the adamant setting, you would like to decrease the number of distance recurrences and the local regional breast cancer recurrences. So hold on a minute. Hold on a minute. Ich bin uh, kann momentan nicht telefonieren. Worum geht's? Worum geht's denn? Yeah, where is it? Then we'll see you on Monday. That's no problem. Yeah, is that it? Okay, sorry for that. So what you're going to see here is the local regional breast cancer recurrence and the distance breast cancer recurrence. And they are just substantially reduced by the treatment. And that is what we're actually going to see in the node positive cohort. And this is justifying this treatment. So what we've seen so far, everything what we're going to see in the HER2 positive world is happening at the extracellular domain of those um, on the four domains of the HER2 receptor. But naritinib like tucatinib and lapartinib are tyrosine kinase inhibitors, and they are just enabling to offer you a dual vertical blockade if you just combine that or if you just use it on your own. And that is what you can optimize if you just would like to rescue those patients. And also the mode of action for the dual blockades between ER and HER2 uh, signal pathways are shown here in, in theory, but this is working very nicely and is the argument why you would like to combine these two treatments. And that has been done in the excellent phase three trial. And I think every one of you is aware of that. And I don't want to redigest it, but I want to give you an idea that naritinib for one year, 240 milligrams, regardless of the management of your di of the diarrhea, something like that, over placebo is just adding, adding a 5.1 difference in invasive disease-free survival, which translates in a 42% relative reduction of recurrence if you offer this to those patients which are on an elevated risk. And this is in specific for those patients with a non-PCR population. So in my clinic, if I have a patient who was neoadjuvantly treated, a non-PCR, went to TDM1, and then she's asking me after one year, what can I do? I would offer her at least for the, 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 the options to start with naritinib for this one year. And if she stands it, it's good. If not, we are just taking her off the medication, but we have given her the chance. And you're going to see that um, at two and five years is a tremendous benefit of 4.6 versus 7.4%. And that is just worth the candle to do it. So we have then published, uh, and that was issued in 2021, an overview about all the clinical trials which are running. And as we speak, all those in the gray boxes, all, most of them are finished. So it's so such a high speed development that you cannot keep it for granted. So what is a plan for a future trial is reality tomorrow. And, 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 and that's why we put it here into this perspective. So extended adjuvant therapy, for example, could be added wherever you're going to see a star here. And, and these are three options in the hormone receptor HER2 positive world. And I guess that is what you should discuss in your tumor boards to offer those patients these options whenever you have the situation to do it. And importantly enough, patients with residual, residual disease are your candidates. So in, in the German breast guidelines, we were just giving those algorithm for the neoadjuvant therapy in HER2 positive early breast cancer. And you read it from the left top to the left 
far right and from top to bottom. So if you just if I walk you through this in the small tiny tumors, so these are the Tulane cancers, surgery up front. If that is PT1 or PN0, it's just paclitaxel for one year. If surgery is revealing that you have a bigger tumor or it is not positive, then you can choose your basement. It could be tristuzumab only or a combination. And then you can offer them for one year narratinib only or more receptor positives, stage three and two. And the same thing is in the bigger tumors. Bigger tumors, more than two centimeters in size or null positive. Dual blockade for six or eight cycles surgery. And then based on what we discussed, you're going to give your treatment whatever is needed. The ESMO 2022 therapeutic options are showing the same thing. And you're going to see in the node positives and hormone receptor positives, most of the advocates are suggesting to use narratinib. And, and that is what you should take into your clinic, to, in your, in your um, uh, scrap suit or wherever you're going to do it. And then you'll find these are the principles of adjuvant treatment in this setting. And I guess that's a good way of doing this. So I do not hope that I confused you. I hope that I could uh, walk with you the way you are treating your patients. And uh, I'm happy to take your questions. Once again, I appreciate your time and that you are just uh, listening to my presentation. So with that, I would like to give back to the chairman of the session and thank you so much for having me. Thank you, Dr. Christian. There is no confusion. We all agree with the whatever you have uh, said. I am just. I was just wondering that how there are very few T4 more than uh, four nodes uh, cancers in your all these trials. You know, but we get quite often those. Any change uh, in treatment, new adjuvant treatment uh, you make uh, in the, such situations because pathological uh, PCR we want. And yeah, that's a very a good, PCR. it's a very good question. It's a very good question. And we have done um, a, a trial. I'm, I'm not putting this here into perspective where we started. And that is almost 15 years ago. There was dose dense uh, EDC treatment. Uh, principal investigator was uh, uh, Volker Möbus. And, and that's the same thing what Citroen and others did in the US. So for those patients with four mo mo notes and more, we, I, intensify the treatment in a dose dense fashion. But if you take now these days AC or or EC every 14 days, so two weeks plus GCZF and then weekly paclitaxel, this is a dose dense treatment anyway. So the question is, and the, these you can combine very easily in the neoadjuvant or adjuvant setting with dual blockade of your antibodies. So you're totally right that uh, those patients with more than four positive lymph nodes have the worst outcome. And I know that you see those very often in your country, but if you offer this patient, for example, 12 times paclitaxel weekly plus a dual blockade and then switch to EC or AC Q14 days plus in cardiac monitoring, then you're on the safe side. And you would not have more remissions or survival if you do this dose-dense treatment uh, as we've seen this uh, from Citroen in the US or our trial. But it's a very good question. Thank you so much for doing this. Thank you. Well, uh, Dr. Jaikesh, uh, that's an excellent talk. And uh, I would just like to have an insight on the classical debate of uh, anthracycline versus a non-anthracycline approach where, uh, what are the ideal candidates where one could uh, offer anthracycline-based chemotherapy? One is probably the more number of nodes. Any other take on uh, that? Okay, fair question. I've, I've tried to show you that in those with a low risk of recurrence, small tumors, uh, node negativity, uh, Sandra Tulane's trial is giving you a de-escalation where you use only one antibody, trastuzumab, and where you do not need any anthracyclines. And the, the follow-up data I showed you is that there is, it's just a flat line, you know, in overall survival, and, and that's perfect. And, and you can also go for, for carboplatin. That is what the U.S. West Coast is doing with uh, Dennis Lehman's group, 
we are not doing this. We are not using carboplatin in the HER2 world, but it's an option. And uh, and 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 uh, what well, we know on the long run that the enter cycling. So we in Europe use mostly apirubicin, and I don't know what's in India if you have enter um, adramycin or apirubicin. Both, both we uh, have both. both. Both, you know, we would never ever use it, be but but in the US, <clears throat> apirubicin was never licensed, so this is why they are using AC. And adramycin has is causing more 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 uh, cardiac damage. So whatever you're going to do, you can put your pride in on that. But we are not doing this. We have a perfect profile um, with the AC Q14 days plus GCSF followed by 12 times Paclitaxel weekly. This is the dose-dense treatment. You okay. know, and, and, <clears throat> and, 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 and there are some arguments that platin is enhancing a resistance to the anti her treatment. So whatever you're going to do, it is something like that. So as a routine, you don't add carboplatins in your regimen? In in my institution, we are not doing this. In our guidelines, it's a fair option based on the level of evidence. Okay. Yeah, and you can do it. Are, are you doing it? Yes. Uh, yes, yes. Yeah, it's an option, you know. It's totally yeah. an option. And the evidence from the trials are very good. Um, and and it, it's an option. If you have if if your PCR data are in the range of Dennis Lehman's data, then you are on this on the on the sunny side. That's perfect. You can do it. No, but DCH is not standard. DCHP not standard uh, for you for uh, say more than two centimeters uh, tumor. Sorry, DCH. No, no, I, we are not using that. So for the very small ones, I mean, if you. If you just give me a second, um, I will show you this here. If you're gonna see Sarah Tulane's data, uh, Sarah Tulane, where is Sarah? Where are you? Adjuvant affinity. Sarah, where are you? Um, Catherine. Ah, here. So if you if you're gonna see these data with Paclitaxel 12 times and that and it is a non-randomized trial. Paclitaxel 12 times in one year for trastuzuma. One year. And you're gonna see here the um these are 10 years invasive disease free survival. Two, four, yeah, 10. One, two, three, four. And these are in this range. You cannot top it. I mean, if you add then a dual blockade in these patients plus carboplatin or an anthracycline, you're just adding tox. No, but these are not negative. Uh, how these do are you all not negative. So the initial cohort was positive. Two positive Smaller than three what centimeters in size and not negative. So we are just only accepting that for two centimeters because there were only, I guess, in this foreign patients, three, uh, four or five percent of being bigger than two centimeters in size. But I'm sure you'll be using for node positive uh, more than three centimeter tumors. Hmm? For more than uh, four nodes and more than three centimeter tumors. Yeah, you cannot put it in here. This is this is reserved only for tumors smaller than two centimeters in size and node negative. Yeah, that is okay. But in that's more okay. Than and then whenever you know, whenever you escalate, the the biggest issue is you have to escalate it properly. No morbidity, no mo mortality before you do surgery. And what I guess, what I guess in my in my way of thinking, is that the neoadjuvant approach, and this is this is the way I I consider this was my team, that checkpoint one the most effective t therapy, and then surgery, and then you have a non PCR. What are you going to do there? You have to change your anti her two treatment, and you could could add, for example, xylora or something like that. But but this is not a given at the moment. 
I personally would do NGS testing on the non-PCR arm and then looking for some mutations or agnostic testing that I'm going to see maybe there's a HER2 a mutation. And if there's a HER2 mutation, I would go for um, a, another treatment option. So do you do uh, the genomic testing as a routine? Now we're doing this, are, we're no, doing this in an institution. Are... No, it's a good question. We are doing this in an institutional single arm trial to see if there's coming out anything. You know, it, it would be very interesting because we've seen that from her to low that the treatment is changing the level of her to positivity. But nobody is actually in the position to offer then if, if your initial her to positive signal is vanished after your neoadjuvant chemotherapy. So, and, and you only have an, another population, nobody's changing the uh, uh, winning horse, you know. But if you can if you can demonstrate that the, gem, the genomic landscape is also different, you know, then that okay. would be an interesting piece of cake. But we are far away from that. Okay, any specific uh, subset of patients where you would consider adding uh, the trial you should extinate? Yeah, I would do this um, once again, the, like I mentioned, in those being at risk, which are uh, the non-responders, non-complete responders having an endocrine sensitive tumor then i would and, offer that yeah and uh, so what dose you use you you want to modify oh, the, the, dose that's the standard i would start with two times on uh, 1500 okay and then i have to re you know xeloda has a very r wide range of uh, flexibility so you cannot you can play a little bit around that you know like like the music box, you know the the the, 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 the number where the patients feel fine. That that's perfect. Right, uh, sir. Uh, one more question. Any Go ahead. take on uh, like we have discussed in our earlier sessions as well the role of uh, pathological complete remission. Uh, we all know that uh, there's no complete biomarker as far as the HER2 positive subset is concerned. So do you feel that there are in your practice uh, you feel that there is a need or some other biomarkers that have been tested at your institute or some of the trials you have to indicate I mean, that yeah you know indian india is a rich country you know you can do whatever you want you know we are a poor country if 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 i don't have a target why should i test <laughs> you know i don't have I, I i'm only interested you know i'm only interested in a her2 mutation in the non responders and this is why I'm torturing our pathologist to have a look um, at the non-PCR tissue. So if I would be a young doctor and would go for research, I would beg everyone, give me your non-PCR tissue and some, you know, some serum samples to see what's going on. I have no idea uh, if the new world of circulating free tumor DNA would be a new target on that. You know, that, 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 that's something which is coming up. But what we've learned that if you do not have a PCR, it doesn't make any sense to extend your systemic treatment. You know, then do something different. Okay. So, uh, one, one silly question I have. Uh, I mean, what is for uh, achieving a PCR? With less than three centimeter node negative, you do give TH uh, only. Uh, and uh, for more than three centimeter node positive disease, you still give THP in those patients or uh, you add carboplatin in that? Um, as I mentioned, I'm not a big fan of carboplatin in these patients. Okay. So the only chemotherapy where we are adding, but I'm not saying we are just, we, we're doing it right. So what we have added from data we've seen so far is Xeloda. That, that's a good way of doing this. But the problem is, you know, when you're going to start with the, um, with the carboplatin um, treatment, so then you have to see if there is any evidence that you continue with Xeloda on doing that, you know. So in other words, whatever regimen you have, hit the tumor hard in the first therapy and then try to be sophisticated in offering a, no, a post a neo adjuvant treatment, and and you know may, maybe maybe tilts might be a good idea 
to stratify, to high, to low. Uh, th that is such an interesting dynamic field here that you guys should be networked together. And, and in India has how many new cancers a year, breast cancer? We have 25, 23 uh, fascists, roughly 20 uh, uh, lakh. Yeah. How many patients in total are you nationwide, breast cancer? Breast cancer, roughly about 2 lakhs. That is 200,000. Uh, 200,000. So for yeah. with 200,000, as sad as it is, you know, you could, should connect. You know, you have a perfect infrastructure. You know, you are perfect in IT, where we are not in Europe. <laughs> so you can do it. You can connect yourself, you know, and everybody gets a little, a little shiny crown and is the king and the emperor of one trial. And then you, you collect it. You guys are suing so great. You know, do you know the trial where you put local anesthesia into the cavity of the, of the breast and you have an overall survival? This is a trial that has been presented from India. It's fantastic. You guys do such perfect things. Connect yourself and find your own solution. And ESCO, ESMO, and everywhere would be happy to see the data from India. Right. Sir, uh, one more question. that uh, Do you have any experience of adding immunotherapy in the neoadjuvant setting? Sorry, if I have any idea to come... Immunotherapy. Immunotherapy. Absolutely, yeah, but but in triple negatives, you know, we've we've seen that at ASCO. Uh, sorry, what was it now, San Antonio? No, no, for uh, particularly, a, I'm talking about her two positive triple yeah, negatives. Yeah, right, but uh, yeah, the, the, uh, um, Shireen Loy did it, but she failed. So it's it's not it's not like a cocktail, you know, at Harry's New York bar that you just put in your glass whatever's in the shelf. So you have to do trials to see that it's not working, but you cannot. You cannot over-treat the treat. You know, the driver is her to positivity. And and that's fair and enough. So don't don't do too much because it, you're just going to fail. Okay? Right, sir. Uh, are you happy? Very happy. One, very happy show it. You. Show me your smile. Question, one silly question I want to ask. Go ahead. You are a head of uh, OBS and gynae. means you are a surgeon. Yeah. And you're doing uh, medical oncology as, as a, well. As, right. as well. So there you do both uh, surgeon and physician also. Yeah, this is by our education. You know, we uh, the rest of the world, it's only doing in Austria and somewhere in uh, Argentina, I guess. Okay. You know, and, and, and I learned in Japan, there are some crazy folks doing this. So the, 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 this is why we are so good at neoadjuvant therapy, because I just want to speed the systemic treatment up that my pathologist is not finding a single tumor cell. Okay. You know, So if, if I would be a surgeon, a patient walks in my office, surgery would be an option. The only one, because I can only do surgery. You know? So this is a little 15 minutes of fame of German gynecologic oncology and breast cancer surgery and treatment. That's Fantastic. It. Fantastic, Dr. Christian. We had, uh, I mean, lovely, all city and good question we had to ask, you asked and lovely answers we had. And thank you very much uh, for giving your time and uh, uh, such a lovely presentation you gave to us. Thank you very yeah, much. Yeah, likewise to your questions and I hope that we next time do it face to face. Okay. So enjoy the rest of the meeting and um, thank you and bye-bye. Okay, bye-bye. Take care. Bye-bye, guys. You. Bye. Thank you, Dr. Christian. Thank you. Bye-bye. We have some time. Dr. Amit is there. We have, uh, yeah, we have one more session to do, sir. Hey, Dr. Amit has come? Yeah, Dr. Amit has yeah, come. Hi, good evening. Good evening. Hello, hello welcome, Dr. Amit. So uh, uh, we have a next ses session on panel discussion, and uh, we have our eminent uh, oncologist, Dr. Amit Ratham, is from Bangalore. and. Uh, He'll be discussing on um, basically role of uh, PCR, as we have discussed since uh, 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 evening. And uh, the panelists are Dr. Nitish Garg from Ludhiana, Dr. Kanika Sharma from Mohali, Dr. J Jagdeep Singh from Ludhiana, and Dr. Mukesh Bansal again from Mohali.
and Dr. Suresh Patel from Jalandhar. Are all panelists in? Dr. Ratham, please. Yes, sir. Good evening, sir. Good evening. Welcome. Right. Okay. Uh, good evening, everyone. Um, thank you for having me here. So what what I do is I just yeah. So these slides are visible, right? Yes, they are visible. Okay, great. So I was hearing the the good discussion and the questions. So actually, everything has been discussed. So we'll just quickly take it into a case based thing so that. We are all on the same page. That's the only thing. Uh, there was a lot of talk of research, but we are not there yet in India. At least we, if we can follow absolute guidelines and treat as per guidelines also is very good for us. So research is something that we all want to move forward into. So let's just take a, a, a quick case to kind of take up the whole discussion. So this is a 49-year-old female who gets um, who has a history of uh, uh, a lesion in the left breast. And she has some family history also positive. The, the size is about 38 uh, millimeters. So, uh, and there are no lymph nodes in her testing. And the biopsy shows her IDC grade three, ER positive, PR is negative, HER2 is three plus, um, KI67 is 60%, 60 percent. So it's basically a CT2N0, M0, and that's the MRI, right? So let's start off in this kind of a patient, uh, Dr. Nitish, how are you thinking of, of, of her uh, uh, strategies for what, what do you think you are think of risk of recurrence and what all factors do you take in and then what, what way do you want to decide forward? You have a T2N0, M0, it's about somewhere about almost four centimeters. Right. Thank you, sir. So uh, first of all, her age is one of the factors, then the menopausal status of hers, then the size of the tumor. And other thing is the her, uh, her high key sixty seven index. Right, right. So, 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 uh, and when you see such kind of patients with no negative, what are you thinking of in this direction in her two positive patients? So, uh, though it is defined as an early breast, but the size is more than two centimeters or maybe three centimeters, we can take. So, I would still like to give her a new adjuvant treatment with uh, probably a single drug of uh, single anti her 2 is also fine and uh, followed by uh, surgery so that will okay. be the so you, you, so so new adjuvant is absolutely there and you are talking of chemo plus single agent so yes. so uh, and if we'll just complete it what is your regime you are favoring so it is uh, tch but as we have heard saying so where uh, okay. uh, the size is more than three centimeter, he uh, very well presented that we would consider to add on pertuzumab. So I think that can be fairly well taken and added. Okay, right, right. Uh, so Dr. Kanika, your thoughts on this kind of a situation? So, sir, uh, definitely uh, the overall patient has to be assessed, uh, like what is the performance status, what are the comorbidities, whether the patient is having diabetes or hypertension to start. <laughs> So, yeah, all these factors has to be taken into account. And uh, since she had a T2N0 but a higher uh, tumor size, then uh, would definitely prefer a new adjuvant approach followed by surgery in this case. So, uh, new adjuvant is surely there. And what is your new adjuvant approach usually? Uh, sir, if the patient is fit and affordable, then TCHP for the patient. TCHP sir. for okay. So so TCHP for <laughs> right, uh, right. So I think I think all of us kind of have moved to absolutely agreeing on uh, this high nodal, high size T size, and calling this a high risk disease. And we have all moved to going to new adjuvant therapy. Uh, uh, Doctor Jagdeep, is there any patient on her two positive whom you don't want to do new adjuvant therapy? Any, what is your cutoff? So maybe like a tumor size less than 0 0.5 centimeter to one. It's one of the subset of the patient, which I may not be giving a new adjunct chemotherapy. Otherwise, any uh, patient with more than one centimeter, even 
I will be prefer to give uh, NTA to therapy in the NACT. Okay, so new adjunct for everyone more than one. Okay, right. So I, I think that's how most of the guidelines say. Though clinically, we kind of have we 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 kind of look at two centimeters and say less than two, we'd probably still push some patients into surgery. Uh, but more than two, we are we are definitely saying new adjuvant chemo uh, and anti her two therapy. Uh, and Dr. Jagdeep, uh, which combination for new adjuvant? So I usually don't add uh, carboplatins in the less than three centimeter two to three centimeter. I go with the TPH. And if the tumor uh, has a more than three centimeter, I nodal button. Then I add a carboplatin to the TPH pair. Okay, and pertuzumab for everyone? Uh, if affordable, I will yes. definitely okay. offer. Right. So I think I think all of us are on the same kind of page in this that all. All the guidelines say uh, new adjuvant chemo for all HER2 positive patients. I think node positive, there's absolutely no controversy. Size-wise, most, most guidelines look at two centimeters and say more than two centimeters, we all go for new adjuvant therapy and less than two, sometimes going for surgery followed by adjuvant is perfectly okay. So uh, I, I think I think we will definitely, all of us agree on this. Now, uh, uh, Dr. Mukesh, uh, coming to that discussion of uh, new adjuvant chemo in the present era, do you use anthracycline for any patient in the present era? I don't think I have Dr. Mukesh. Okay, uh, Dr. Suresh, can I come to you? Uh, yes, sir. Good evening, uh, sir. Yes. Yeah, hi. Uh, sir, I prefer anthracyclines, especially uh, in our... Uh, our institute, uh, in view of uh, logistic constraints, uh, ERPR had to report is awaited. So, locally advanced disease, then I initially start 4AC, but anthracyclines do well, especially in uh, bulky lymph node positive uh, locally advanced breast cancer. So, I start initially with 4AC, and as per the HER2 report, come, I give them the option of. Uh, uh, chemotherapy plus targeted therapy along with it. Right. Absolutely. Okay. right. Absolutely. It's clearly understandable that this is always a, a, a issue which comes up many a times when the HER2 is getting delayed for various reasons. And then sometimes you want an urgency of starting an anthra, you start off the anthra and then later with the taxane you add in the, the anti-HER2 therapy. So, so, uh, so, so it was perfectly okay to choose which chemo you are comfortable with. We have also moved to TCHP because of convenience. We, we moved away from anthra quite a lot. Now, nowadays, we hardly give anyone anthra, except if sometimes we have two groups of tumors. If you have one group of tumor, which is HER2 positive and one group, which is HER2 negative simultaneously, then you sort of kind of are not sure and you want to do the anthra also. But otherwise, most of our patients get TCHP or TCH if patients are not affording for pertuzumab. So clearly... Um Clearly, new adjuvant chemo is there and all of us are very uh, comfortable with this kind of situation. So we did discuss this about uh, the combination of using pertuzumab, trastuzumab. Uh, so if I can come to uh, you, Dr. Nitesh, uh, so, so doing, doing combinations, what has your experience been with TCHP versus something with only trastuzumab in terms of CR rates in your clinical experience? I think the CR rates have improved tremendously, sir. So uh, the high lymph nodal burden disease patients have responded and they have achieved CR. So probably the rate will be somewhere around 65 to 70 percent. Right. That's 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 really amazing to see how how good the CR rates have become. Dr. Kanika, same experience, CR rates. So, sir, actually, I've experienced even a higher uh, PCR rate as documented in the trial. So, I think only two of my patients they did not achieve PCR with their doublet uh, or two targeted agents. The rest, the response is very good, actually, with the dual agent. Absolutely. I, I fully echo both of what both of you have said. Even we analyzed our data over the last few years, and we saw our patch CR rate was 85%. And mm -hmm. even with ER positivity, we still saw a high, high patch CR rate. Though we keep saying ER positive has less patch CR, ER negatives have much higher patch CRs. But I think all our experiences have been really good. Uh, 
everyone asked why tdm is not being used but then we say tdm use has come down because of the double hurt to you are doing up front and the more tchp you use the more lesser tdm one you are going to use into practice and that's absolutely what we have seen so i think all of us are very familiar with the data all of us are very impressed with the patch cr rate of tchp and this has become an absolute standard of care uh, dr jagdeep so tchp is there and what's your thought about iv versus subcutaneous in clinical practice do you think they differ and what do you do yes uh, now a lot of data is there and of course rosh is the uh, publishing that more that we have to go and the data with the francesca and i think diff, uh, uh, one more trial if i'm not sure which has shown that patient are more adherent and even that subcutaneous it gives a better uh, patients compliance towards the treatment so so have you have you started? yes so i just want to say that i have given five patients this fasgo and i have 100% pcr so nice. all have achieved the pcr so Excellent. mine that's, is even more than 85% i don't know why no no that's the way it should be and that's the way it is you know it's amazing to okay. see the high the fat cr rates even in bulky disease and that's why all of us are very impressed with this um, dr suresh what are your thoughts about iv versus sub q do you use iv or more of sub q sir uh, i prefer using subcutaneous i do give the option of subcutaneous fasgo but uh, only around 5 to 10% patients are affordable i have one patient on fasgo and uh, she she had a complete pathological response presently she is on maintenance fasgo therapy right right so so uh, so what we have learned is iv and sub q don't differ at all it's so much more convenient to give sub q and it's also much less expensive to give fasgo because of the way the support programs are designed so i think i think in the last one year i would say i would have, i have not given a single patient new adjuvant iv pertuzumab trastuzumab everyone has been on fasgo and i think that's where all our practices are changing initially all of us were a little hesitant thinking that volume is going to be too much pain is going to be too much but eventually once we have seen our patients comfort patients themselves are saying this is absolutely good and we have learned from the metastatic setting where they just take fasgo in the opd basis for for years so it's so comfortable for them they just coming and just take it on the opd and just go back and that's why i think fasgo has made a dramatic change though though i can still say we were all a little bit slow adapters we we still took little hesitation because we had that hesitation ourselves in our minds rather than the data the data was right there but we kept thinking maybe it will be inferior maybe our patients won't accept it and we made those decisions in our minds but eventually patients are very comfortable and i think responses are very very comfortable so we have seen all the data of getting pat cr and this has all been discussed and this is a, a kind of accepted that we are all comfortable with getting I didn't catch that could you try again okay. so we are all very comfortable with uh, with going with this kind of a treatment now you gave treatment and you got pat cr you gave tchp and you got pat cr what do you do dr nitish after that after surgery so uh, sir as per the catherine trial the uh, i mean uh, uh, we can see that there was about i think 16% of the patients who were receiving pertuzumab otherwise uh, they were mostly on tch so if it would have been a larger number of uh, data subset on pertuzumab it might would have made a difference and the use of tdm1 would have reduced so if the disease is positive definitely shift to tdm otherwise i prefer to give them uh, a combination dual anti uh, anti her2 as a maintenance therapy okay so dual her2 post tchp as maintenance right dr kanika you gave tchp got pat cr what do you do next so sir i usually in pat cr continue with trastuzumab alone and in this case maybe hormonal also since she is er positive but okay. yeah so 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 my thought was dual versus single uh, dr <laughs> jagdeep what what do you do dual versus single post pat cr so uh, i'll go with the single adherent therapy with the hormone therapy that will be my choice okay okay and dr suresh you also dual single sir i agree with uh, 
the panelist I go for single agent and tiered. Okay. And so so I think this has always been a controversy because of our our I think Indian setting. Uh, the international guidelines is exactly what Dr. Nitish has said. Uh, dual HER2, PATH CR, still continue the the dual HER2 and finish off the year. That's how the international guidelines are. But but even I in practice, who get, if I get PATH CR after TCHP, even I do single agent trastuzumab and finish off a year of single agent. And that's probably the way we have seen our own experiences of PATH CR. So th this data is very, very... This data is shown many a times, Dr. Swain's article, which said that the difference in PATH CRs matters of what you get. So what you get from a single agent HER2 as a, a PATH CR, even those patients, they do poorer. If you did dual and then you got PATH CR, they do much better. And dual followed by dual have a slightly better. But but I think I think I think that difference is very slight. So we are in clinical practice, we are comfortable doing dual HER2 PATH CR followed by single agent trastuzumab. Except maybe I think patients who started with a very high nodal burden, uh, maybe maybe those with N2 diseases or those with very big tumors, and you are very reluctant to say that you know they will do well enough. So that's patients where we do HP also. But yes, uh, as per guidelines, HP to finish off a year, or or I would say even trastuzumab for a year is perfectly okay. Yeah, right. So 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 this was the article which we were talking about where you difference. De depending on the path CR, you differentiated and you said so. So clearly, this 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 article said that the the EFS was poorer if you got path CR by only single agent Herceptin, and there the hazards were much bigger. But when you got it from uh, the double combination, it was much it was higher. Uh, but again, again, I, I I I kind of when you go through the whole full text, the difference between the post HP and the post H. For, is not that big and it was not really very huge but clearly that's how the guidelines have been made okay so then then uh, so so this patient gets 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 the whole standard tchp and gets a good response gets operated and gets residual disease so ypt1c ypn0 so we didn't get a fat cr in this patient she's one of those 10 to 15 percent of patients who don't get it and we have to take her further um uh, what thoughts? I do I have Dr. Mukesh? No. Okay. So 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 thoughts how to move forward. Uh, Dr. Suresh, patients didn't get PATH CR, and how do you take this further? Sir, uh, as the patient has not uh, received pathological complete response, I will give her the option of uh, TDM one therapy, and. Uh, Followed by, uh, along with uh, uh, MDT discussion with radiation oncologist for uh, adjuvant RT and uh, hormonal therapy. Okay, so so you are fully convinced about the TDM for this group of patients and shifting to TDM1 is the thing. Uh, uh, Dr. Jagdeep, when you see patients who did not get a PATH CR, do you differentiate yeah. between... The, the the residual burden of disease so this was a this was one of the criticisms of the catherine trial when we saw the data sets we never did an rcb here and we never did an rcb score when we looked at catherine catherine divided them and did tell us why pt1 t2 and that way and did look at all those subgroups but we never had an rcb and these days we always do rcb and in our minds whatever said and done rcb1 at least in old data sets you saw rcb1 and rcb0 was almost the same so, so do you start differentiating this in your mind and thinking, no, a YPT1C could be RCB1 sometimes. Should we should we really offer them TDM1 or should we just stick to trastuzumab or do, or do you offer it for higher nodal residual burden disease? So uh, I would first concur that if the residual disease is there, the option is there TDM1. But honestly, this, this I have not differentiated based on the scoring. But if the patient is a high nodal burden, and uh, of course, again, uh, post NACT, still the residual disease shows high burden disease. Definitely, I go with the TDM1 along with the RT and the adjuvant therapy and the hormone therapy. And the right. hormone therapy may be backbone of uh, like of uh, patient with the AI along with the like CDK46 abdominis. That will be my my plan of treatment. CDK46 would become very. 
controversial. You, I don't think you can offer that to a her to positive patients in the current so, era. At least, I don't think we should do that because that that data set is yet not there, and I don't think we should offer her CDK four six in any her to positive patient in the adjuvant setting or the metastatic setting. So I would agree with your so, thoughts of PDM one, uh, but I would really disagree with the thought of using a CDK four six in adjuvant setting for a her to positive. So maybe uh, that's true because we could we should not use with that. Uh, when the HER2 is positive, but maybe because of the patient is better, we don't have a database, but I, I may be still inclined to use the, uh, think of this drug in this patient. Okay, I think I think you're stretching the the borders a lot, but it's it gets very controversial. So we do not. Uh, so just to clarify, if there's any this thing that there is absolutely no data of approval of using a CDK46 in a HER2 positive patient. We have seen data sets, we have seen the trials, but but they have not yet been convincing enough reports to say that we can use it in clinical practice. So, but hormonal therapy, absolutely. You could go with tamoxifen or you could go with AIA plus LHRH and we are perfectly correct in that sense and give her hormonal protection also, which she absolutely requires. Uh, Dr. Kanika, differentiation between any burden of disease left behind, do you think so or everyone TDM1? So, uh, so practically, I'm not doing it uh, to assess that tumor burden. and uh, But yeah, it should be done. And um, in the future, whether the patient, how much is the response, whether it is an NC2 disease or whether it's just and compa comparing what was the baseline disease and what, uh, like in this patient, she already had just a T2 disease and she still has a T1C disease. So even if the tumor burden, but at presentation also, the tumor was not that much in the burden. So in this case, maybe a TDM one uh, I would like to offer, but uh, yes, I'm not following the RCB uh, assessment score, but it should be followed. Yeah. So 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 I I think uh, this uh, analysis is very clearly shown that everyone benefits with TDM one, even if they had YPT one A. So so that's the that's the good thing about this kind of analysis. Though though we criticize a lot saying that RCB was not done, but what we eventually saw, they looked at all the subgroups and even with the YPT1A, there is a benefit. So that's why in clinical practice, it is said that if there is any amount of residual disease, probably we should offer them all TDM1 for, for all our patients. So I, I think, I think uh, all of us do talk to our patients for TDM1. There's no question about that. Again, there are always issues of cost and the duration of therapy and everything else, but but we are talking to all our patients about TDM1 for residual disease. Right. Um, so 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 uh, I I think all of us mentioned this uh, radiotherapy concurrent concurrent endocrine therapy, and this has been looked at in the in the Catherine data sets. We have clearly the data saying that it does not matter. You 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 get the same benefit irrespective of whether you're using radiation or whether you're using the uh, hormonal therapy. So clearly clearly it's there for everyone. Dr. Nitesh, are you a are you a perfectionist to say I would use it only if I had overall survival and not use it till I did the OS advantage or I'm okay with the PFS advantage which we had? I think so. Disease invasive disease free survival is a good surrogate marker because uh, breast carcinoma has become a chronic disease as of now. So achieving yeah. overall survival might go years together. And not offering a patient what could have been offered uh, may be criminal as of now. Right. So, so PFS is good enough. But, but just to uh, just this year's San Antonio was very significant for this reason. We got the OS advantage for Catherine. So, for this is this is for everyone who who kinds of always says no. I want to see the OS. I'm never happy with PFS. Though, though the good thing in breast and her two positive, no one ever says that. Uh, at mm -hmm. least in the, when we keep talking of it, but it was very good to see this data. So we saw the IDFS advantage. We had seen the earlier uh, IDFS of 11% when we kept showing the old data sets, but now at seven years, we have a 13.7% difference in IDFS. It's very, very remarkable and significant. Hazards of 0.54, the same hazards which was going on from the start. That's very significant. Every subgroup again benefited. That's again very significant for, for us to say, uh, we would offer it to everyone, whether the patient was ER positive, negative, what they got, node status, and every subgroup benefited. Uh, I, 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 so this was, again, the seven-year follow-up for the residual burden of disease. This has always been a contention. So this also shows every benefit, every benefit was seen in all the benefits, irrespective of residual burden. And I was very 
impressed with the OS. So, so, so this was what we had seen in 2018, where the OS events had not happened and the uh, hazards for OS was 0.7, but we it was crossing one and there were not enough events to actually look at OS at that to 18, five years ago analysis. And this is the OS curves, which we have seen now presented just, I think a week back. So we have a OS difference of 4.7% at seven years and you have a hazard of 0.66. So clearly, Clearly, there is an overall survival advantage, and it's always it's always very convincing when you have OS advantage to talk to your patients. You know, you you can always tell them IDFS, but eventually it will come that it will not progress. But they will ask, "Is my cure going to get better? Is my potential to cure going to be better if I am going to go for this kind of change of therapy for fourteen months? And uh, will it really affect my survival?" And now we can very convincingly say that that's the best thing about these long-term curves. We say at long-term you have an OS advantage and it is statistically significant. It's, it's not one of those one persons or so where we get into a lot of debates. It's a clear convincing overall survival advantage. So they also looked at all the subgroups in the OS in the San Antonio. And again, clearly every subgroup benefited. So I think, I think very convincing data, um, uh, Thoughts on this, Kanika, OS, you happy with this kind of data sets? Okay to use and talk to patients about overall survival or would you would you be saying that you will look at that? You know, there are many, many places where we used to say 10% we want, but this is not 10%, this is 5% at eight years. So, so like Dr. Nidish said that with breast cancer, we already have a very good results with the existing, like with the TCH also. So getting that 10% is actually difficult with the newer, even newer agent also. But yeah, the uh, having an added OS benefit beyond IDFS is definitely a show shot and it's helped to counsel the patient also. But with the previous data also, we are using TDM1 in the adjuvant setting and it has, you know, further <laughs> proved that it is a good option in the residual disease patients. No, yeah, absolutely. A very good point. I think, I think that's a good point to say that even with your previous therapies, you are at 84%. You know, mm -hmm. it's amazing to see that. So now you're reaching 90% and that's that's very, very amazing. Her to space is really good for our patients in long term, even in the metastatic setting, the way we have changed practice, the way the adjuvant practice has changed. Survival of our patients is really exceptionally good. Um, Dr. Jagdeep, a question. If you, if you did TCHP and you saw residual disease, and then you did HER2 and HER2 turns negative in that residual disease. What do you do in practice? Still, I'll continue with that. <clears throat> I'll, the anti other therapy will be there because approximately close to 10 to 15% per patient, they tend to become HER2 negative post urgent chemotherapy. That won't change my treatment plan in this patient. Right. Absolutely. So this is... And I will go with the... TDM1. Yes. Yeah. Yes, uh, yes. Uh, Absolutely. I think I fully agree with you in this thought that the 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 they actually they actually looked at this subgroup from the Catherine data and they found that there is a small group of sample size there. It's a small number who actually turned to be negative post surgery. And they got the same benefit. And so that's why there is a clear analysis saying that the benefit is the same even if you were her to negative post-surgery. So that's why the decision-making is better not to change your decisions and give your patients the same decision which you were taking with TDM1 and don't go by that HER2 which has changed and become negative. So my thought is... Why just, you... just, want to, just, just want to have one thought from you if you can give me. So I had a similar set of patients but in, uh, she was metastatic. I gave her uh, this uh, anti to therapy and she had some disease progression. So usually hormone positive, we tend to see whether that become a hormone negative or not. So if patient is a uh, HER2 positive and we give some therapy, so at the progression, will you check for a gate repeat HER2 therapy, HER2 status or not? And if it's negative, so still you are still uh, inclined towards to giving in the metastatic setting, not in the adjuvant. So this this happened with me in a practically. So I'll give you what I did. So first I want to ask Ms. what you will, but your thought will be on this. 
So, so in breast cancer, if you are HER2 positive to start with, and you are you are convinced from your reliable lab that it is positive, then usually you will always be HER2 driven. That's the thought. Always, it is always said that post post HER2 therapies. That's the reason why in breast they never that's made guidelines like stomach. So in stomach, our guideline is clearly if you are HER2 positive and you progress on anti HER2, do a biopsy. Thirty percent will lose HER2, and then change and don't give them anti HER2 if they are not positive. But in breast, we always believed HER2 positivity doesn't go away per se, though you may sometimes have tests which may show negative. But I think the world is going to change because TDXT is going to come in. And once TDXT comes in, it doesn't matter if you're HER2 3 plus, 2 plus or 1. Well, plus. I, that, that I agree that because that doesn't yeah. matter. So I think so, I think from, from January 24, it's going to change even for us in India. So I think all of us will have some other option. So, so irrespective means what the patient on progression, there's no other option. Means there is this is the best choice. We have to give TDX irrespective of what we are thinking. Yes. In case I, of I, metastatic. That, that, that will definitely so 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 till now we've always said don't even if you had a HER2 positivity, though you may do the biopsies and tests, mostly they will always be HER2 positive. So losing an HER2 in breast is very low percentage. It's not like stomach. Stomach, it is huge. And stomach, even HER2 is not even a driver. Many a times, though, we say HER2 is positive. And that's the reason why in stomach, our guidelines are very different. But in breast, it's completely different. And I think we are learning this more and more. But of course, the, the way the new drugs are coming, things will change again into our practice. So I think, I think, I think, huh. so, so, so we've, we, 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 we completed this also. And I think this is, Clearly, this is our standard of care. And I, I, I'm sure after the discussing with the panelists, all of you are already practicing this for, for the last few years. So there's really no, no dilemma or, or doubt about this for practice. So my question would, what are you, so if you look at this trial, is there anything which sort of worries you and you think about what, what would be, what, what, what difference would it be for some group of patients? So my thought is coming for, uh, possibly brain metastasis. Do you think it will differ? What do you think, Dr. Nitesh? So the chances will be definitely high, but as you pointed out, those high-risk patients, uh, the size of the disease, and then there is a residual disease. As XNET trial was presented, so once neratinib is available, I would still like to add a neratinib after a completion of uh, TRAS TDM1 one year. I think one year of neratinib yeah. may help us uh, uh, redu reducing the chances of brain metastasis. Right. And you do it to which group of patients? So if those uh, those high-risk patients who are ERPR positive, and then there is a residual disease. Right. Perhaps so node positive. So no positive, ER positive, I think that's the place where we would do it. We, I, I think all of us would definitely be inclined to do that. Uh, we know these patients still have a risk of recurrence, but of course we don't have neratinib in India. So that's the decision which really is, goes out of our hands. And we know we can't replace the TKI with other TKIs and get the same result. So that's a difficult thing. So um, uh, were you kind of Kanika surprised by this data showed that there is no difference in the brain metastasis in the trastuzumab TDM arm versus completion of uh, the the trastuzumab itself did that surprise you in Catherine? Uh, sir, actually no, because I was going to point out because the patient who continued on trastuzumab plus minus pertuzumab, they are actually the responding patients who have uh, responded to the disease. They have a PCR, so not that aggressive when we talk about the HER2 subset. And TDM1 is still the option for the first line, actually, we are using in HER2 positive brain meds because TDXT is not available and to cartonib we are not routinely using. So it has the, so in the patients who have, uh, you know, high risk and they have residual disease, we are treating them with TDM1, which has a brain uh, penetration. And the other group is already a responding group with no residual disease. So yeah, instead of over-treating that, okay, the other group may have uh, brain metastasis in future. I think it's a perfectly you know, conducted trial and that's why they don't have that much incidence of brain metastasis, which I see. So, so, uh, so I think I think you're right there. We don't really need to discriminate anything. Any residual disease, give them TDM1. We don't need to really look at any subgroup. But but it did surprise me when, I, when you see Catherine uh, TDM1 versus trastuzumab arm, 
the brain metastasis is exactly the same. So TDM1 is not protecting for the brain, which we were hoping it would protect because in the metastatic setting, we had seen the benefit. When we had seen the comparison of TDM versus lab cap, we had clearly seen the benefit of trastuzumab there, TDM1 there. So that was very surprising. But, but we know uh, we know how this setting is different. This adjuvant setting is very different. I, I, and I think as of now, all of us are absolutely uh, aligned with the same thought that we would not really discriminate in any factors and give trastuzumab M-tansin for all our patients. Who I mean, sir, with uh, can yes, I have yes, a yes, comment? So uh, there is a residual disease and we have uh, changed the treatment to TDM1. So in that way, we can think it in a different way that the high risk patients who had a residual disease, TDM1 does equally better like trastuzumab where there was path CR. So in a way, it is a positive thing. So I, I was thinking in this way, uh, correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, Otherwise, the incidence would have been higher, but the TDM1 yes. resulted to the same The level residual up. disease, not achieving path CR, not having a higher brain metastasis or a lesser brain metastasis is a good thing because with only trastuzumab, we are achieving the same. And once the residual disease is still there, we are still achieving the same uh, chances. No, of but, but, but look at it this way. In Catherine, your randomization starts non-path CR. Right, and they are getting TDM1 in one arm and trastuzumab in the other arm. Right. So if trastuzumab is protective, you should have had lesser brain mets in TDM1 compared to trastuzumab because your randomization is there, and this is high risk for both arms. So that's why I, I, my thought was I would probably I was thinking we'll get less brain mets, so that kind of surprised me. But but again, we all know this, and that's why all the new trials are looking at various combinations, and they are looking at adding TKIs to these adjuvant arms, TDXT in adjuvant arms, and everything is coming in. And I think with time, a lot of changes will come. The way we are moving forward, all our algorithms will keep changing. But but what we can definitely say is this algorithm of using TCHP, getting path CR, has already changed our practice. Less and lesser patients actually receive TDM1 in practice because 80, 90 percent get path CR. And all of us have experienced this. And those who didn't get path CR, we offer them TDM1, and they are the survivals are extremely good. So I think we will conclude. Uh, thank you very much, all of you, for that excellent discussion. It was very enjoyable. And with this, I will kind of conclude my thing. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Dr. Amit, and all the panelists for your uh, lovely participation and we, uh, wonderful discussion we had. I think we. Uh, we have taken care of all the minor nuances of uh, her to new positive disease. Uh, thank you very much. And over to uh, organizer, uh, Dr. Sandeep. Uh, thank you, Dr. Amit. It was a very nice discussion from your end with all the panelists. So uh, just one thing that we had a discussion in our uh, earlier talks as well. Do you routinely do the biomarker testing post new adjuvant chemotherapy in your real world practice uh so so no not not doing uh, uh, not testing for her to again no not, that we are not doing but we are doing a lot of other tests these days um we are including a lot of ngs testers looks looking at a lot of things you know trying to see which are these subgroups looking at her to mutation that that's kind of really changing the way we think because we are learning slowly when you are when you block using an ADC upfront, you know, then there is a chance that you get a HER2 mutation as a resistant mutation. And then these patients post that can respond to a TKI better. So you're doing a lot of a lot of various things for different reasons. But as of clinical practice, I don't think for we we take it for a decision making for changing HER2. And uh, regarding the RCB score, because in our histopathological reports, we don't see a comment on the RCB score. So what is your take on that? I, I think, so So this is one thing you should talk to the pathology. It's a very easy calculation. It's not a big deal. We have made it mandatory in our institute for the last three years that every patient who gets a surgery done has to have an RCB score, irrespective of whether whichever subgroup they belong to. It matters a lot because it gives you a lot of uniformity in thought later. So, so we... We have made it's not it's it's an online calculator. It's very simple. Just putting those three parameters, and the pathologist can give us the RCB score. They tell us zero, one, two, three, and that makes it very easy. So we we have made it mandatory, and I think all of you should talk to your pathologist to say that please give us an RCB score with the final report. 
and you already answered another query regarding the use of CDK four six inhibitors provided in the high risk patient. Yes, as of now, not standard for clinical practice. It's there. It's there. We have those trials going on, which have trials which have shown us some subgroups in the metastatic setting, how they are, what's happening to them. But but we really don't have any CDK four six use in a HER two positive patient for now. For adjuvant setting. Not even for metastatic setting. Right. Okay. Not for any HER2 positive patient as of now in clinical practice. Right. So, uh, thank you, Dr. Amit. So, in the end, it was, uh, I would like to conclude by saying thank you to the chairperson, Dr. Rajeshwar, sir, who has taken out his precious time and made this event possible. And to our speakers, starting from Dr. Christian Jaikish. Dr. Abhinil Mittal, uh, Dr. Uh, Amit Rauthan, Dr. Naval Bansal, who have been a great support and have carried out this event in a in a manner that it should be because it was an academically driven agenda. So we came to know, we have learned a lot of things regarding the HER2 positive early breast cancer because it's the area which is actually underlooked at what are the practices we are following nowadays. So in the end, I would like to thank our sponsors, Roche, Milan, Glenmark, Reliance, Fresenius, Samarth, and our event management, Mr. Tarun Mathur and his team who has provided the tech support. So thank you all and have a good weekend. Thank you.